session then. Um, and just advising you that uh, the, the meeting is now in public session and therefore been recorded and broadcast. Uh, just to anybody that's in the public gallery, those swades down there, that, uh, uh, but for people a bit closer as well, just at mobile phones, um, if you can keep them away from the microphones because they do uh, interfere with the system. And that the oral evidence sessions that we have today as well will be um, reported by Hansard. In terms of apologies, we don't have any apologies, but I think the Public Accounts Committee is still in session, and I know Trevor Lon is still a member of that, but um, we have no formal apology, and at the minute, maybe he's going to join us. Um, in terms then of item two, the draft minutes, these have been circulated to members uh, from our meeting on the 12th. Uh, they start on page five of your meeting pack. It's just a minor typo, which is about a date. The date referred to the 12th of February when it should have referred to the 5th of February. Um, so that amendment has been made. Are members content that the minutes are correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we can sign those. Um, so uh, I don't have any matters arising from the minutes, but do any other members have any matters arising they wish to raise? No, okay. That's painless enough to get to there, so then we can have move into our first session, oral session, which Craig's just going to get the people for us. Gentlemen, you're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Please take a seat. And there's water there in front of you if it gets too hot and heavy in here today. But it should be grand. Hope that's not portentous, Chairman. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome. Uh, maybe what I'll do uh, as you're um, along today to give us a, a sense and a flavour of the uh, communication and executive support uh, element of the executive office, uh, we could maybe begin by just some introductions. I can start off, my name's Colin McGrath, I'm the Chair of the Committee. Uh, Mike Nesbitt, Deputy Chair. Emma Sheehan, Sinn Féin MLA in Ulster. Ron McCollin, Sinn Féin MLA West Belfast. Hot Sheehan, Sinn Féin MLA West Belfast. Christopher Stolford, DUP Assembly Member for South Belfast. George Robinson, East London Derry, DUP. Uh, Trevor Clark, South London DUP. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, some members are meeting for the first time. Some I'm afraid have had to endure me before. <laughs> so sorry, you know what you're in for. <laughs> then, can I introduce my two colleagues, uh, Neil and Chris. Chris heads uh, Executive Information Service, and Neil heads the Executive and Central Advisory uh, Division. Two important parts of what is actually a very eclectic uh, directorate within TEO. So it also includes, for example, the private offices and the offices of the head of, the head of service and the Programme for Government and NICS of the Future team, intriguingly named. Uh, the committee, I think, is scheduled to receive a briefing from the PFG team in a couple of weeks' time. If you're wondering what the NICS of the Future part of that means, it's a I suppose, slightly outmoded term now, but it refers to a programme of organisational reform and development of the NICS uh, that took place over uh, the last few years. Uh, I think that's something that's likely to be given further impetus by the report of the RHI inquiry uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, so that's probably a part of the directorate uh, that will become busier uh, and pick up pace as we go on. Overall, you might, I think, regard us as the machinery of government or the home of the cabinet office type functions uh, within TEO uh, for the devolved administration. <coughs> as part of that, uh, one of our key roles at present is supporting the executive and its consideration of the New Decade uh, New Approach Agreement, and linking the Executive's work on that to the development of the Programme for Government, and along with our finance colleagues, uh, the Budget. Turning to our briefing paper, Chair, I, I trust that members have found that uh, helpful. I don't propose to go through it line by line, but we'd of course be happy to expand on any of its content, uh, and perhaps before doing so, if I could just outline very briefly one or two of the key challenges as I see them uh, by way of introduction. On Neil's side, the key challenge is clearly restarting some systems and processes that have been dormant for three years in what is actually quite a challenging context. 
Many of those involved are new or are in new positions. There are, of course, new Assembly members, there are new ministers, but there are also many officials in key positions, even senior positions, with limited or in some cases no experience of working with ministers or committees or the executive or through the legislative processes of the Assembly. And that's largely a result of something that sometimes gets under the radar these days, the 19% reduction in the size of the NICS overall in recent years. Uh, we lost a lot of corporate memory uh, and experience in that. So if it feels new or restarting for you, it also does for, for many of us. And that places a fairly heavy demand on Neil and his colleagues at present in terms of advice and guidance out across the NICS to departments to try and get that machine uh, running smoothly again uh, and, and at full pace. On Chris's side, the enduring challenge, of course, is getting a coherent and effective message out on behalf of the executive. Again, in a very challenging context, there has been and there continues to be what you might call a channel shift with social media now becoming much more important and prevalent than it was uh, in years gone by, especially for younger citizens. And even with the pace of that change continuing to increase uh, year on year, new channels, new platforms coming along uh, all the time. We were just having a discussion outside and it's very important now, I'm told, to know the difference between Instagram and Snapchat. And I confess I haven't the faintest idea uh, what either of them does. But the information space is highly contested, so our message is not the only one out there. It's noisy and there is a level of cynicism uh, about the climate of fake news that we've all experienced in, in recent years. So the challenge for Chris and his colleagues is to be the trusted source of candid, accurate and timely information uh, about the, what, what the executive is doing. And I think the third limb of the challenge in this area, but this is something that spans all of the directorate's work, is the very high level of public and political expectation that the devolved institutions are going to deliver on the things that matter to the citizens. And therefore, our particular focus um, <coughs> throughout the mandate, but I think particularly over the next month or two, will how we can support the executive uh, and the assembly in taking forward work on a uh, new decade, new approach on the programme for government and the budget, and making it absolutely clear to citizens the difference that that's going to make on the ground. Chair, that's been a very quick skim over the ground. We'd be more than happy to expand on any aspect of that or anything in the paper. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, tempted to talk about Morse code and gramophones, but we'll stick to Instagram and Snapchat if we can. Uh, I also, I always forget to say to people coming in and, and, and need to improve this, that everything has been covered by Hansard today in, in this uh, report. I think that's the equivalent of what your send's been written down and may be used against you, but it's just to make sure that you're aware that, that that's happening. Hansard, I understand Snapchat. I <laughs> okay. Look, um, there's just a couple of questions that I have um, to, to begin with. Um, one of the issues, I suppose, just in terms of information coming back and forward, which is something that we, we need to um, have improved. Um, you know, we need reports to be timely in making their way up to ourselves so that we can give uh, due consideration to the reports in advance uh, of us then discussing them at our meeting on a Wednesday. I think the general protocol is that we have uh, noon on a Thursday as being the receipt of information in order for it to sort of filter through the system to get the members and give them time to read it over the weekend and then be ready to um, discuss it the following week. Now, we had an issue last week with a paper that wasn't presented um, on time, and we have a continuing issue at this stage with um, the European, the Brexit subcommittee, uh, where we have asked for a report, uh, a, a presentation to be made at next uh, Wednesday's meeting, and we have asked for the papers. We can also go to Hansard and see where um, the Deputy First Minister has said that information can be provided and forward work plan and will be shared with the committee etc. We have requested that and we've been told that officials are going to come up and present but there will be no written paper um, that will be sent up in advance. We've queried that um, and have asked for an explanation and we haven't received anything and obviously there's only another uh, 24 hours left before uh, the closing time for receiving that. Having Park, maybe the specific issue with you, and ask you to go off maybe and check that out for us, because I believe sure, it's, sure. it's within the responsibility. Can we ask just in general about papers, how they're approved and how they come up? Because 
in the instance where the first Deputy First Minister is saying that information can be provided, we request the information and the response is that officials will not be providing a written paper. Is that officials that are taking that decision or is that a ministerial direction that those officials don't send that up? And is there a way that we can progress that if there is uh, a decision <laughs> taken not to share it, that there's an explanation given as to why that paper won't be shared with us, i.e. the ministers have not approved the paper or the department hasn't approved the paper, but rather than just simply being told, no, nothing will be provided, um, is there some way that that could be assessed? So there's probably three or four points in there for you to address, and if I could pass that on to you. Certainly, Chair. Uh, on, on the specific points, certainly we will take that back this afternoon uh, and get an answer for, for the committee. And I think then related to that, yes, I think where a, a decision is made, we owe you an explanation of, of that decision, uh, and we certainly aim to, to ensure that that's the case. Generally, um, we recognise it's our role to assist the committee in its work. Um, we can't do that, and you can't do that unless the information is provided in a timely fashion. Uh, and we absolutely uh, accept the need to, to do that. Any official, I think, giving evidence to any committee would, would point out that they're there on behalf of, of their minister. They're there acting under the control and direction of their minister. And all of the evidence that we give uh, has to have the, the, the approval, whether explicit or, or otherwise, of the minister. The unique factor, of course, that we have uh, in TEO being a joint office is that that has to have the approval of, of both sides of the office and both ministerial teams. So just in process terms, sometimes that, that can take uh, a little bit longer than it might do in another department. The onus then is on us as officials because we know that. We need to anticipate that and make sure that we secure uh, that, that approval earlier. But to answer then your, your specific question as so far as I can, because I'm not familiar with that particular request, but if a decision is taken not to provide a paper, then that ought to be a decision for ministers, not for officials to take. But if we haven't, as a department, provided you with a full explanation of that, then we ought to have done. And I'd certainly take that back and make sure it's remedied. OK. And I think I would have the support from the committee if I suggest, and as, as, you know, as, as open a way as we can, we'll not be tolerating not receiving papers in a timely fashion. And if we don't receive a suitable explanation, I, I would fully expect that the committee will just dismiss any presentation if we've asked for written information and don't receive it, and we'll have to pursue other avenues to try and secure that information. And we want to try and establish that at the beginning of, of this committee term so that we, everybody clearly knows where we stand, because if everybody knows where they clearly stand, then we, sh we won't be straying beyond that. But 12 noon on a Thursday, I think, is the, the time that we're looking for uh, information that's going to be discussed at the committee the following week. The only sub-question I have to, um, <coughs> to, to not related to that, on just the, the information that was provided in the report, 47 press officers. I, I mean, I, I wish I saw weekly, daily newspapers being delivered out of um, the, the departments, and I would love to think that Twitter... Um, information stream is completely filled uh, with information from the departments but these could be my observations but I certainly don't see the output of 47 um, press officers. Can you give me a flavour just for the work that the 47 of them do? Yeah, with your permission, uh, I think Chris might be expecting that question. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I did anticipate that question, Chair. Um, so obviously the 47 press officers are spread across the nine different departments there to support uh, the Minister's portfolios. Um, some of the work is <coughs> very visible in that you will see press releases, social media activity supporting ministers when writing about. Some of the work is not visible. Um, some of the conversations we have with the media is to try and clarify some issues that don't, be, that don't make it into the news. So the number of press officers has been something that has been raised on numerous occasions. Um, I think it's a proportionate number for the size of the NICS and, and our workload. And certainly, um, I wouldn't want to increase the size of that uh, unless there was a real business need to do that. And if that, and that is the case, then the business needs had to be made. Could I just ask for maybe, if you could you supply a, a, a paper, uh, or just a quick response on how many press officers there are in the other devolved regions? Is that something that you would know? Or I don't know it off the top of my head. Is it something you could but secure? I could, yeah, I could find that out. Just to, for a comparison to yeah. see just sort of how many are, are there. Um, Ike? Oh, thank you, yes. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you're the communication gurus. So what is the difference between Instagram and Snapchat? 
Somebody else? Yeah, <laughs> certainly do. Um, so there are obviously different channels for different audiences. Snapchat is um, for a younger audience, and, and Instagram is for a slightly older, younger audience. Um, there are... Um, what age brackets? I, I think Snapchat... Um, I feel a bit of a fraud, you know, 50-year-old man trying to tell you the latest developments in social media. Um, but I think Snapchat is in the region from about 8 to 14. Instagram is um, the 14 to 20 bracket, bracket in and around that. Um, yeah. I'm not sure our communications expert describing themselves as a fraud is necessarily a good look here, Chris. Um, well, I've been called worse, uh, <laughs> Chair. Um, but, but I do think it, it, it is a serious point. Um, in that social media is a very evolving field. EIS has made huge strides in relation to social media over the last few years, but we're not, I'm not complacent that we don't need to do more. Um, you know, there's, there are channels in social media that are, that are targeted at specific stakeholders. We need to understand that more. We need to understand that better. So maybe fraud is an overstatement, but certainly what I'm, what I'm saying is that it's a fast, a fast evolving field and we need to try and keep up with the pace of it and try and somehow get on top of it. Delivering a coherent message was described by, by Chris as a challenge. Why is it a challenge? Why is it a challenge? Yeah. Um, I think the nature of politics would make it a challenge. Um, Certainly a coalition government. So you're saying, you seem to be implying that the coalition government is incoherent and the challenge is to make it coherent? No, I, I, I certainly wouldn't use that word to, to describe it. But I said implied, Chris. Uh, no, well, I'm, I'm not implying it uh, either. I'll, I'll try and be very ex explicit uh, in my answers and, and uh, not ask you to work out anything from implication. I think when you have a mandatory coalition of five parties with distinct and sometimes contrasting uh, political views uh, on a range of issues, take, for example, Brexit uh, being one, but nevertheless a requirement on those five parties to come together in an executive and govern Northern Ireland, then the, the, the challenge is doing that in a coherent way, arriving at policy positions that are agreed and then coherently presented. But I wouldn't want you to give the impression, or to me to give you the impression, that I thought the executive was behaving incoherently. Not, not at all. If, just if I may, just on, 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 on Chris's earlier point, and yeah, I think the, the serious point behind my facetiousness uh, about social media, uh, but it also relates to the Chair's question on the number of press officers, they're not just press officers, they are communications experts. Uh, I've shown the depths of my ignorance in social media. Like many journalists, that's simply not a mode of communication that I'm familiar with. It's not something that I grew up with in my civil service experience. So I rely on, on Chris and his colleagues in AIS to help me get that coherent message across. I know how to do it in a ministerial speech. I might do it well or badly, but I know how to do it. Writing for social media is a completely different skill and one where I would recognise I need a lot more help to do it. A few years ago, in, a, in an attempt perhaps to be coherent, the, the executive brought in uh, David Gordon from the BBC to head up communications. Now, as I understand it, that role no longer exists. There are no plans to fill it. I don't know that a formal decision has been taken to do away with the role, but there are no plans okay, to it, fill it that I'm aware of. It's lying vacant. It's lying there vacant. are no plans to, to replace it. So what does that tell us about the role? Does it tell us that it wasn't necessary, that it was unsuccessful, that it was a waste of money? In answering your question, I, I risk speculating. Uh, I, I don't know. I can only conclude that the current First Minister and Deputy First Minister haven't seen the same need for it as their predecessors. Okay. And the Government Advertising Unit. Um, as you say, social media is now, is now the place to go. So one of the consequences of that would be that adverts that were traditionally placed in the print media are no longer placed in the print media, but are placed via social media. How does that impact on the relationship with newspapers? Yeah. So um, I don't think it's a blanket approach, is that? Mm. Um, so through the government advertising unit, we would go out and procure an advertising agency to deliver whatever particular campaign what was a department wanted to deliver, and they would then come up with a mix of communication channels to reach a wider audience as possible. So yeah, look, so social media is a, is a growing part of some campaigns, but it is not the not the only part. And there still is a place, or there still is a part of media plans, the role of traditional print media for for adverts to be placed there. Can you give us any sense of what sort of cut there has been in the budget for that type of advertising? And for. 
print media. Print for print media. I, I couldn't um, because I don't. I don't think I, I don't have that figure. And I suppose it comes from campaign to campaign, a campaign that is targeted at people um, who traditionally would read newspapers would be heavy spend on that, and a, a campaign targeted at younger audiences or, or the announcers would be targeted primarily through social media. So it's a mix of channels. Mm -hmm. Final question is, to what extent have you centralised communications within the executive office rather than leaving each government department to do its own thing? So again, do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Yeah. So all, in the way that the executive information is structured, all press officers belong to TEO and they're outposted on the <coughs> most departments. Uh, they then are responsible for the communications within that department, but I am their, I am their professional head and they, they talk to me about any uh, relationship. There's no formal structure that you talk about, that you, that you've talked about, but certainly um, on issues that are cross-cutting, I would expect to be made aware of them, but I'm, I'm not there to mark their homework. They're talented individuals and can do their own thing. Is it the same structure in Wales and, and in uh, Scotland? Um, I think Scotland is perhaps more centralised than what we have here. Um, and Wales, I know they did a restructuring exercise, I'm not fully across the detail of it. It's because it's a one-party government, yeah. it's going to be more central. The whole, the whole structure of, of the Scottish administration, I think, is, is more centralised, okay. one party, and they, they don't actually have separate departments there, it's just the Scottish government. Okay, thank you, Chair. Christopher, um, if I could just, in the presentation, uh, we were told that the civil service has been reduced by 19%. Has the number of press officers been reduced by a similar percentage? Um, so there were a number of press officers who left through Voldray exit scheme. Um, and I also looked at during departmental restructuring. I, um, it gave me the opportunity to actually look at a, what services we would want to provide with ministers and officials and how we'd be resourced to deliver that. Mm. So I don't have an exact figure for on the numbers during departmental restructuring. Um, but they are less. But they, the figures now are less than what they were there. Okay. I. I mean, I have sympathy for press officers because I worked for one, worked as one for five years, uh, in DUP headquarters. Um, we were the biggest political party in Northern Ireland. Our communications unit, I think, at its height, maybe had five people in it. I do find the figure of forty-seven just incredibly high across the government. Now, I maybe I'm being naive about that, um, but I do think that. 47, is, it seems to me very difficult to justify that number. Well, I, I will say this. Um, none of my staff are, are sitting idly, idly okay. by. They're, they're fully engaged. Um, they're very committed to what they do. I know press officers have been have, have received a reasonably bad rap in the media for whatever particular reason. I know that because of that, some press officers have left the discipline and moved into general service. I'm, I'm confident I can stand over the 47 figure. Um, and I'm confident that all of them are fully engaged in what they do and try to support their minister and the department. I, I find social media to be very useful, particularly actually I prefer Facebook in terms of picking up constituency cases and stuff like that. I find Facebook very useful. In terms of the question that uh, Mr Nesbitt raised about advertising and advertising spend in newspapers, has mm. there ever been a review of that in terms of assessing whether or not uh, social media would represent a, a bigger reach and a, a bigger opportunity, or is it simply we've always? Had, I mean, I was in Belfast Council when there was a review yeah. of advertising policy, yeah. and it was always, you know, there was almost this assumption we always advertise in the telly, the yeah. Irish news, the newsletter. Therefore, we must continue to do it. Mm. But if you're not getting the benefit from that in terms of audience reach, because clearly newspapers in general are in decline, does it represent best value? So uh, I'm not aware if there ever has been a review, and certainly not in, in my time. Okay. Uh, but um, and I, I can see this from both sides. As a former journalist, um, you could argue that uh, newspapers still hold a <coughs> place within certain communities. Course, and yeah. if you are trying to reach a particular demographic, then that's fine. I've heard the other argument that um, sometimes having a, an ad in a, in, a, in a job section or in a, in a newspaper presents a persona of a department that, that actually goes beyond beyond the ad itself. I'm not sure I totally subscribe to that theory, but I've, I've heard that argued. Um, but I think um, <clears throat> for campaign advertising in particular, you need a mix of media channels to satisfy yourself that you are reaching all the audience that, you, that your, your campaign is looking to reach. Mm -hmm. In terms of the 13 campaigns that were run last year, 
Could you give us a flavour of what those campaigns involved, what, what they actually related to? Um, it may have been in the paper but I didn't No, they it. weren't. Sorry, I, okay. I should have included that. And I haven't got a, I haven't got a list at hand, but some of them were around um, certainly communities make the call campaign. Okay. Um, I think some of them are obviously road safety campaigns as well. So it's a mix of public messaging campaign, and again, for, for the Make the Call campaign, that was a mix of traditional and social media to try and uh, reach as maximum uh, audience as possible. <coughs> and how, at the end of a campaign, is the success or otherwise of it quantified and measured? So um, the process for a campaign advertising is, is, is pretty rigorous. Um, so the government advertising unit works with the host department or the department that's running the campaign. At the outset, the business case is obviously prepared, but objectives for the campaign is obviously, as, as that said as well, because out to tender, if, if there's an agency involved, then that's prepared and media campaign is, is based on that. And then, then there's an evaluation process to say whether or not they have actually, the campaign actually delivered against the the original targets, and in some campaigns that go for a longer burst than others, then there could be some, could be some interim, mid-term evaluation as well to make sure that you're meeting your target audience. Who carries out the evaluation? It's carried out by the, let me get this right, I, I think it's carried out by an independent research company. Oh right, okay, so it is independent? Yeah. Right, okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Fran? Sure, and it's just to follow on. Um, it's certainly in one of the lines of questioning, and it was in, in, in relation to the, uh, the, the, the advertising thing. And um, I do understand that uh, there needs to be a shift towards uh, uh, a media, media outlets, social media, uh, because that's where most people are clued into. And I, so I do get that. Uh, and I know that there has been, and for many papers, a decline in leadership, uh, but there are still many people who are not clued into social media, uh, who rely on newspapers in terms of advertisements for jobs and for other things, uh, consultations and things, and it would near enough be cutting off your, your nose to spite your face in terms of uh, not advertising, and, and I'm not saying you don't, but uh, have you moved away from that there? It's not either riff, but both. I think, I think that's, that's, yeah. that's the point that I'm making. You have to, if you want to reach as wide an audience as possible, you have to try and use as many channels as possible. And I think the, the point I was making about the, the, the pace of change, I mean, that, that emergence of social media is something that has happened during my career. I remember the time when, when there wasn't any. But the pace of change is increasing. Much so back then. I remember, well, fa I remember <laughs> faxing <laughs> press releases. Yeah. 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 I'll not go that far in case it ends up in that sort. But um, but the pace of change is 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 accelerating. So the, the the social media channels that are the right channels today may not be the right channels in a year's time. And you know we we mustn't be on the lookout for things that will happen over the course of someone's career. It's the things that are changing over a year, 18 months. What we're doing today might not be the, the right mix of, of communication channels this time next year. <coughs> so we've got to be much more fleet of foot than we have been in the past. Mm. OK, Trevor. Thank you. Um, I'm probably most slightly more controversial than Fran. Uh, there, there's been a danger and a culture in Northern Ireland where we spin fed people so much for so long. And I think, actually, it's interesting because you have came from the media, but it's interesting that I believe actually the media have tapped into that in terms of the advertising costs. Because whenever you hear what the cost is for government advertising versus what private adverts are, you would imagine from that that there is a direction of travel that they know you need them. Mm. And, and it's interesting how some things have changed in terms of jobs with Communities NI, in terms of the online system, and people go to job markets and they're directed towards Community NI, but there's still this need that we actually use print media. And for me, I think we've spin fed for too long. I think the whole rationalisation of the civil service and everything else, part of that should be actually how you spend money. So I, I just want to make that slightly controversial point for some, possibly. In relation to a response to Christopher, in relation to the 47 officers, there I would say to Christopher at one stage, maybe we had too many, we had five in the DUP. <laughs> I are. Here, here. So, here. So, that was one of his, Christopher was one of those, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Right. <laughs> but, but, but on the 47, and I'm not saying you ducked the question in terms of the, res the response to Christopher, or the percentage is comparable to the 19% reduction in the civil service. But I think it would be useful in terms of your organisation, maybe that's more so at you, Chris, um, a chart of your organisation, who all's in it and what they're doing, and a comparison of that chart from about four years ago. 
because there has been a culture within the civil service that it's a... Uh, I'll, I'll, not, I'll not say what it, maybe the culture is perceived to be, because I think you've got yourself into trouble making perceptions today, and some of you have said earlier, Chris. Um, but but there, is a, there, is, there, is, there is this thing that, uh, for, for me, in terms of response to Christopher, it would be nice to tie this down, because once we're telling other people to cut their cloth accordingly, I, I think I'm still to be convinced that the civil service have cut their cloth accordingly. I mean, even in terms of your organisation, and you three very... Uh, able gentlemen here today and probably very good salaries as well, but how big is the organisation? How many do you really represent? And is it value for money? So it's more, it's not a question, it's more a request that we could get that organisation chart. Um, the, the other one actually, which I think is contradictory in the sense that public safety campaigns are, are good, however, then some of our government departments are cutting what they spend on actually delivering on the ground, infrastructure being one of those, cut their road safety budgets. On one hand, we have got road safety messages coming out from central government, but on the other hand, we've got government departments such as infrastructure cutting their road safety budget. Do you see a conflict there, Chris, in terms of what the message you're trying to get across, but not <coughs> some of our government departments not taking responsibility by spending the money on the ground? So, um, I think that's a very good question. All I would say is the, the public, the department that so the public, the public road safety campaign that is run by the Department for Infrastructure, it's issues of how much money they want to spend in the campaign or decisions for them on their budget that they, they set the budget. I don't set the budget for them. Mm. Um, so we then deliver the campaign to meet whatever objectives they need through that campaign. But the actual setting of the budget comes from them. So that that's so I don't I don't have any role to play in setting any departmental budget in relation to whatever campaign advertising. But you appreciate, you appreciate my observation. Where on one hand we're going to spend tens of thousands of pounds in the campaign for road safety, yeah. which is important, and I mean there's far too many deaths. But on the other hand, the department's cutting how much they spend actually delivering programmes to prevent deaths on the roads in terms of road safety. So there, there is a, there's a conflict to me, and I'm not, it's not, not directed at you, but it seems to me that a department such as infrastructure have designed, come to you and say, design us a programme, design us something to get out into media to promote road safety. But at the same hand, the same department's actually cutting what they spend on road safety. I suppose I'm bound to say yeah, so to a, previous yes, ministers that may yes, not be the case that, going forward. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Dare me to be, yeah, be a point well made. But sorry, and that's not right to any minister. I mean, I think that's fair point. Yeah. Okay, um, Emma. Yeah, so I just wanted to follow on from some of the points that have been made um, previously. So, in terms of um, Snapchat and Instagram, and I'm maybe one of the people in the room that does understand the, <laughs> the differences. I'm assuming that Snapchat isn't something that you. We don't use, we don't have Snapchat. We have, across the departments, we have a number of social media channels, um, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, some departments of Instagram, uh, but it's not universal across all departments. Right, okay, I just wanted to clarify that. And then leading on in terms of like the budget and increase <coughs> in, in using print media advertising, the vast majority of advertising that you would do on Facebook, Twitter would be fairly cost effective and, and low cost. And I know that you, we talked about um, about doing review of the effectiveness, and obviously Facebook gives you that as an you can mm. you can review how many yeah. people you've targeted yeah. and, and what age range yeah. and what demographics yeah. you're hitting. So I'm assuming that that could be done fairly cost effectively without impacting too much on what you spend then on print media. Um, so in relation to social media, we do do what we call post, post, posted tweets and posts, um, and there's a relatively small budget to that, but you can see the return from that very quickly. Where we use it really effectively is around in NI Direct, where we do weather warning events. So for Storm Kira, we did some boosted messaging and it went out to quite a large audience. Uh, yes. you know, and so that, that's it. But just in relation to advertising spend in relation to print media, so again, that that will be part of a, a mix. So it is around campaign advertising. So a department will ask for a campaign advertising on a particular issue, and they will then come with the mix of channels that they want to use to reach whatever whatever audience they want to use. The observation I'm making is that more and more the budget the budget reallocation there's there's a greater spend on social on social media, um, but there's still a mix of different channels from TV, radio, outdoor, digital, and print. Okay. I just my thinking was that social media could be used almost as an additionality without having to diverge funds away from some other 
well, the, 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 the budget for that would come from the department, so they would say, I have X amount of money to deliver a campaign. Uh, that would then go to the advertising agency and say, to meet your audience here, that here's the mix of channels we will use, and against that mix, here's the spend we will use against each channel to try and maximise reach. Okay. Um, Pat? Thanks. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, what's the cost to the executive of 47 press officers? I don't have a figure for that, but we could get that fairly easily. I don't, I don't know. Uh, well, I suppose how hard or how, how easy a job do you think you would have convincing the ordinary man or woman in the street that there's a need for 47? Um, it's not really a conversation that comes up with, with me in, in the street, to be fair, but I suppose you could, you could argue... Well, there's very few people actually know there's 47 press I think, I think the figure they work off is 160. Week. <laughs> I think the figure they work off is 160. Um, so I suppose you could argue, you could ask that about any, any um, sector of the public, uh, public sector, apart from nurses and teachers, of how, mm. of how many people you actually need to do a job. The only point I'm making is that... The roles and responsibilities which we carry out, um, I don't think there's much fat within the AIS to deliver all those for all the, for the ministers. Okay, thank you, Chair. You want a supplementary? Just, just understand your response there, Chris. Where's the 160? Is, is, are you defining there's a 47 dedicated press officers? No, it's a figure, no, it's a figure that went out years ago that is still quoted in the media as the number of press officers. Okay. That's it's a historic figure. Right, okay. Yeah. You just, you just alerted me. I thought it was no. you were hiding from me. <laughs> no, 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 not, <laughs> no, not hiding at all. But he alerted me as well. <laughs> well, just see your face, I said. George. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris, for your presentation and your team. Well, um, during the last financial year, has run a number of formal and work-based training events, including crisis communications. Yeah. Could you give us an example? Of what yeah, so, um, so I have a... An advert or a training budget um, that I use for the, the entire for across EIS. Um, a lot of it has been spent on social media development, but I, just, I, I commissioned a, an external company to deliver a crisis communications course, which was really an exercise, a tabletop exercise for all the EIS, EIS staff to participate in how we would communicate in the event of a significant. Um, I think it was a an aeroplane landed in the M2 or something, how we as a system would deliver the communications around that, just as a tabletop exercise. Um, and that, that, that was really the crisis communications course. Okay, thanks. Right. Okay, um, I'm sure there'll be 47 and a few others delighted that we've got to the end of this um, uh, presentation. Um, one question I just uh, omitted from earlier on, Many of the other um, devolved regions and, and other governments would have almost like a daily briefing for journalists that, you know, that were from some central source that gives an update on what's happening. Uh, I think it could be the gaggle, as it's referred to, if I go back to my West Wing days, but that sort of um, interaction. I, I, you work for an American administration. I, I sometimes get a, a sense that journalists feel frustrated at getting information, sometimes uh, from from the uh, the executive, is there any plans or any consideration given to maybe increasing the sort of direct contact that there might be between the executive office as sitting at the centre of, of um, the executive and actually passing information <coughs> back and forward out to journalists in a formal daily way or a weekly way? Do you mean to make it easy for them? Well, obviously that one. Uh, First Minister and Deputy First Minister would have to suggest that as an idea. Um, certainly, I know that they, they do it in, in Downing Street. Um, uh, it's not to say that I don't talk to journalists on a, on a daily basis, um, but certainly a formal structure like you're, you're talking about would have to be with the agreement of FM and DFM. I think it does happen in Scotland, and I, I'm not 100% sure about Wales, but I think it happens in other places. And Yeah, OK. Um, well, look... Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming along today. It's appreciated. Um, I know we have a couple of follow-up actions that we will uh, we'll come back to you in writing just for... Uh, Mr Jackson got away lightly there. I was just thinking that. Don't leave him behind. Sure. <laughs> I'll initiate you into the mysteries at some future date, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank There'll you. be a report by 12 o'clock on a Thursday. <laughs> yeah, that is coming up. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a moment just to swap over the table then.
Okay, uh, gentlemen, welcome back. Um, thank you very much for coming back up to this. And we um, have had, I don't think we need to reintroduce, we, I think we introduced last week. Um, so, um, and we got the report through from yourselves and have had time to examine it. So, maybe what we'll do is pass over to yourself, Mark, and your team to just to give us a quick walk through the information that's there. And then members maybe would have some questions at the end, if that's okay. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. Um, I think in taking, in taking the committee through the, pa the paper, I, I won't cover the bits that were covered uh, last week or which are going to be covered in the later um, finance uh, section. So really, uh, we we'll would like to focus around uh, initially together building a united community and that strategy. That strategy was published uh, in May 2013 and it reflects the executive's commitment to improving community relations uh, and continuing the journey towards a more united and shared society. It directly contributes to outcomes 7, 9 and 10 of the draft programme for government. Um, the strategy, or the vision for the strategy is one of a united community based on equality of opportunity, the desirability of good relations and reconciliation. One which is strengthened by its diversity, uh, where cultural expression celebrated and embraced and where everyone can live, learn, work and socialise together free from prejudice, hate and intolerance. So that provides the framework for government action in tackling sectarianism, racism and other forms of intolerance. And the strategy has four key priorities uh, which are our children and young people, uh, our shared community, our safe community and our cultural expression. And those key priorities are delivered through seven key headline actions uh, and then a range of other actions that have been uh, identified. And there are five departments that help to deliver those seven headline actions. And the delivery uh, of those actions is monitored at departmental level through programme boards in each department, uh, sorry, project boards in each department, and at a strategic level uh, by the Executive Office through the Good Relations Programme Board, which meets quarterly and which I chair. Um, the strategy is funded through a combination of baseline allocations in the departments themselves and through the shared future funding <coughs> of £60 million over five years, which was provided from the Fresh Start Agreement. Um, and departments then bid in for a share of that funding every year to the Executive Office and uh, uh, the appropriate allocations are then uh, made. Some £46 million has been allocated to date and we're currently in the last year, <coughs> five years. Uh, the funding is due to end in uh, March 21. Uh, in terms of the seven headline actions, uh, just briefly update on progress. One of the, the first one was to pilot 100 shared summer schools by 2015. Uh, the concept there has moved on slightly to talk about TBUC camps. And we've had over 570 camps over the last, uh, or since 2015, with over 20,000 young people participating in those. Um, in terms of developing four urban villages, in fact five were actually identified, four in Belfast and one in Derry, Londonderry, and, they, and the, those programmes are being delivered at, at present. Um, in terms of establishing ten shared education campuses, development has begun on five of those campuses and DE are considering options on progressing further schemes. Um, the commitment around 10,000 placements for young people in a new United Youth Volunteering Programme. That has been taken forward through funding from the uh, EU um, under what is now called the Peace for Youth Programme. Uh, and since 2017, some 2,100 young people have completed that programme. There are some 7,400 are anticipated to go through that programme by the time it completes. Uh, the commitment to establish 10 new shared housing schemes and 10 of those have in fact uh, been completed. Um, the sixth um, headline action is to develop a significant programme of cross-community sporting events and this is taken forward through by DFC through their programme which is called Uniting Communities Through Sport and Creativity and that has engaged some 2,200 young people um, to date. And finally, the seventh uh, headline action is to remove interface barriers by 2023. And the number of DOJ interface barriers has been reduced from 59 to 46. 
So that's a very uh, brief outline of progress against each of those headline actions. Um, I should say that we have, we have, this is an outcome-focused uh, approach that we're taking to TBOC and significant work has been undertaken to embed that outcomes focus in TEO funded good relations programs. So we have uh, methods of, of assessing before and after the events the impact that the, um, uh, uh, the program has had on young people. So for example, um, in relation to our central and district council good relations programs, there were over 8,500 young people uh, that give, or, sorry, participants in general that give us feedback on that. Some 70% of those respondents indicated that they had a more positive attitude to people from a different community as a result of their participation. Some 75% were positive about the project that they were participating in, and a similar proportion felt the program had a positive role in bringing young people from different backgrounds together. Turning to uh, victims and survivors, um, TEO was responsible for the strategy and policy on victims and survivors, including sponsorship of the Commission for Victims and Survivors and the Victims and Survivors Service. Uh, a new Victims and Survivors Service delivery model was implemented in April 2017, with funding worth some $34.6 million over the three-year period 2017 to 2020. And this is in addition to the $14.9 million that was allocated through Piece 4. Victims' payments, <clears throat> to speak briefly about those, because we had some uh, fairly detailed discussion uh, last week. Um, TEO also has responsibility for the implementation for a scheme of payments to victims of troubled related incidents. Uh, the Victims <coughs> Payment Regulations 2020 were laid in Parliament by NIO on the 31st of January 2020. And as a devolved matter, the, the Executive Office is leading on implementation of the scheme by end May 2020. Um, although plans on the implementation have already commenced, as we discussed last week, the time frame legislated by Parliament is extremely challenging. Turning to the Victims and Survivors Strategy, uh, the period of the initial 10-year strategy for victims and survivors ended in November 2019. And under the EFEF Act, a two-year extension was approved with a possible further short extension if required to allow for development of a new strategy, uh, including engagement with the victim sector and ministerial consideration of the, the findings that came out of that uh, engagement. A review of the current strategy is being taken forward by RSM UK Consulting, the final report is due to be submitted to TEO by the end of June 2020, and the findings and the current ongoing research will help to inform the development of a new victim strategy. Um, in respect of the Regional Trauma Network, TEO is working closely with the Department of Health, Health and Social Care Board and the Victims and Survivors Service to ensure that the Regional Trauma Network delivers on the Stormont House Agreement by increasing access for victims and survivors to the mental health service that they need. And the aim there is to deliver a comprehensive regional trauma service through partnership working, uh, building on existing resources and expertise in the <coughs> statutory and voluntary and community sector. We covered HIA in some detail last week, Chair, so I don't propose to go into <coughs> that aspect uh, today. Um, so focusing on delivering social change, um, which uh, the, the Executive Office leads on this uh, is a cross-departmental uh, programme. Um, there were six initial signature programmes with <coughs> some £27 million, pounds, which sought to tackle key issues being faced by parents, children and families, and they are all complete. And there were three further signature programmes <coughs> that were developed which focused on dementia, on shared education and on early intervention. And these three further programmes were jointly funded uh, with Atlantic Philanth Philanthropies. Um, the early intervention and shared education programmes are largely completed. Uh, the TEO funding for the Dementia Project ends in March 2020, and some very significant benefits have been demonstrated from those programmes, and, and they're now being mainstreamed. And the potential for a further programme to pump prime changes to programme for government indicators will be uh, explored. We're going to pick up on equality, I think, Chair, in our session in March, so mm -hmm. I wasn't proposing to go into that, so I'm just going to, going to, to pause there, yeah. and we're happy to take uh, any questions that there might be. Okay, um, thank you very much indeed for the um, presentation and updating the information. I'm sure members will have plenty of questions, and if I might um, just um, kick off. Uh, there were, um, I know that you jumped over the, the HIA stuff, but there was just an element of it that um, um, subsequent meetings from last week have maybe raised, and we just wanted to ask. One would be um, in relation to the suggestion from the interim advocate about the provision of support services um, for those uh, involved, and just really there seems to be maybe some sort of delay in that, and it was just maybe to get your thoughts 
uh, and views just on because that's the sort of um, the sort of measures that can help provide a bit of support and a bit of help and a bit of assistance, which is something that we all desperately want to see um, offered to those that have been caught up. Um, and we don't want them maybe if, for example, it transpires that sort of red tape or decision making that can be sorted quickly, uh, or maybe to find out some some reasons for the, the whole back and implementing that. And more generally, um, as I read that report and indeed some of the, the other reports, I still remain uncomfortable. Um, and I'm not sure if you can provide any comfort back to this, but these just big wide ranges of costs, you know, it'll be 25 to 60 million, um, but it could end up being 300 million or 600. It's just these big, bold numbers. It's just to try, um, from the, the, the public's perspective of saying, really drilling those down and finding out, how, you know, just how quick we can get those figures um, you know, brought down to actual real figures rather than, than the big wide uh, numbers because that's going to impact obviously your budget and what your, your capacity for delivering. Mm -hmm. So if you had any thoughts on that from, from last week and just the support services um, for HIA. Well, maybe Gareth, you pick up on the support service and then I'll pick up on the, the, the numbers afterwards. Uh, and the support services for HIA victims and survivors, uh, as I said last week, are, are important because we recognise that um, putting in applications, going through with a solicitor what people have experienced could be a, a, a traumatising uh, experience. Um, and the, the, the point there is that the, the services that we would like to have that will be ongoing um, will just take a few months to establish. Um, but what we're working on with the Interim Advocates uh, Office is an interim arrangement that will make sure that people are uh, supported in the, in the meantime. Um, so by the time that the, the scheme goes live um, in, in April, um, there should be access to, to services for people who need it. Um, what we're looking at for the uh, say for the slightly longer term, um, which will just take um, probably until the, the beginning of the summer to get established, um, is services whereby people can be uh, can have a meeting with uh, a caseworker. Um, and can then be directed to the relevant services in light of their need. So if they needed uh, counselling and psychological support, that would be available. Um, if they needed some complementary therapies, they would be available. Um, if they needed help with uh, accessing uh, information from the institutions um, where they, they'd lived, uh, that would be available as well. So we're, we're looking for a fairly comprehensive service, but there, there will be uh, a, a social work based service available in the meantime. Just before you come in, Mark, last week the interim advocate had suggested that there were quite a number of the vacancies within their flow chart or their staff to organisational chart. Now, I think there's maybe only six or seven staff, but three or four of the positions were empty. Um, is there a way that you could work to quickly address that? Because I think some of those positions were advocacy workers and support workers, and that might help to very quickly uh, assist in providing some of those activities. Can we get a reassurance from you today that, that, that those positions will be filled as quickly as they possibly can? We're, we're absolutely working on that. We're also working to see, uh, particularly on the research side, um, what will sit in the Commissioner's Office and what will be provided in this service that I've just uh, been describing. So there'll be some additional support <coughs> coming from that service. Um, but yes, we've been working with the Interim Advocate. Um, there was a particular issue uh, just in the next few weeks because a member of staff had a, a holiday booked that's been booked for, for a very long time. Uh, so I'm lending him one of my staff uh, who's been in the office before um, and we're working on all the other posts uh, to try and speed things up. I'm on the research post, uh, I'm looking to see if there is a quick solution we could come up with there. Um, we've uh, agreed on a personal secretary post that we can bring somebody in from an agency. Uh, there are interviews taking place I think in the next couple of weeks about a, a health and social support uh, post, um, so there should be somebody in within the next four to six weeks. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, we're working on all of those. Right? I, I must say, I welcome and accept, and, and the motivation is 100% perfect. It's just a message that it sends out to those 
in the sector that if staffing has to be borrowed, it doesn't sound good. That it, you know, and I know your motivation is perfect in that, but it just that underscores the need to fill those positions properly. That the, the service doesn't have to borrow staff from places to be able to do their work. So I, I, I should say the member of staff that's going down to the office previously worked with Brendan McAllister doing the same job, so he, he will be known to the uh, to the victims and survivors <coughs> groups. Mark, maybe just on the budget. Yeah, I think maybe just to, to, to make a comment on the previous question as well. It's important, Chair, to emphasise there's no difference between us and the, the, the Commissioner here on on the, the posts that have been identified. We have agreed to fill the post, and we're doing this best endeavour to try and get the po those posts filled as quickly as possible, which is why we have been taking some staff from, from our own team and finding various ways that we can to try and get the staff in place. But we want to move towards a permanent position on that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, turning to the whole question of figures, I understand the... the, the Committee's concern about uh, the the uncertainty in the figures. It's one that, that we share, and indeed that ministers and others would share. It is um, important the commitment that was made um, by the executive to victims. Um, but one of the difficulties of dealing with such historical issues and dealing with homes which are in many cases no longer in place is that the numbers and the records simply aren't there in many cases. And trying to establish uh, how many people may have gone through the homes. <coughs> How many people of those that went through the homes uh, are still alive, uh, since many people haven't actually, um, maybe haven't shared their experiences, uh, uh, even with their, 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 their spouses or their siblings, and maybe have not uh, indicated to anyone that they had these kinds of difficulties. So trying to get a figure, uh, a base figure around that, and then from that trying to determine how many of those will actually come forward seeking uh, redress. And when they come forward to seek redress, how many of them uh, will have will be able to demonstrate on the balance of probabilities, as is required, that ab that abuse was suffered? And then, what judgment will the redress board make about the appropriate award in light of the evidence that they have received? So, those are the range of parameters that we're dealing with. Um, and I think I, I, I mean, we did talk about this in, 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 in some detail last week. It's an uncomfortable truth that it's impossible to get a precise figure. All we can do is to make our best estimates um, based on certain assumptions, and as we get further information, try and refine those estimates down. So currently, we have a range of, of figures. Uh, at the lower end, we're, we're, we're saying this could be somewhere in the region of, of about £149 million. Pounds. Our central estimate, which is the one that we're focusing on mostly, is just over £400 million, £402 million. Pounds. And at the upper end, it could go up as high as £668 million. Now, we don't think it will but it's a possibility. Now, what we will do is, as, as the, um, w when the, the uh, application system opens and we start to see the applications coming in, we'll get a better sense as we start to see the flow of applications as to what the likely numbers are going to be. But again, um, we will have to keep this under constant review because we will be having a publicity campaign to raise awareness uh, of the availability of, of the scheme, and that might take time uh, for people who aren't uh, well, even for people who are, who, are, who are local to think about it and decide whether they want to come forward, but also for those who are maybe further afield to become aware of this game and then come in. But this is not something that lends itself to, to precise figures, and I think it would be wrong of us to try and give precise figures, which is why we've always talked about a range, and we're trying to make sure that in the financial planning that the executive does and the Department of Finance does, that they are aware of what the potential costs are so they, that they can plan for that and we will, we will, we will um, improve that and refine that as more information uh, becomes available. Okay, well, the campaign should be all right. There's 47 press officers who can assist you uh, in that work. Um, in terms of the um, TBUC side of things, um, you mentioned just that in terms of programme finishing soon, just exploration, it just will be explored about um, the potential replacement funding. And I know many organisations, not least the likes of the Youth Service, that would have very heavily utilised that funding to be able to deliver programmes for young people, especially in the summertime. Um, I suppose there could be a fear that that funding is just going to dry up. Could you give me a sense of what exploring it would mean? What, what is it that you need to, to explore? Is it just as, as, as much as you need ministerial direction to say we're prepared to, to, to refund this again? Or is it the, does there need to be an evaluation done on the programme before you would move to the next stage? You know, what, what would allow it um, to, to move to the next stage? And if it does, would there be any um, opportunity for... Um, some of the guidelines in it to be um, maybe evaluated because I do know of, of some organisations that there was like geographical um, stipulations and I can't remember which side it falls up but whether the groups couldn't be more than 15 miles apart or they couldn't be 
less than 15 miles apart, but it meant that geographically some communities struggled to actually be able to participate because, especially of the rural nature, it meant that, you know, time-wise, by the time you travelled to uh, groups that were further away, it didn't make the, the programme worthwhile, whereas if there was something that was nearby, but the, the rules didn't permit it. So could something like that be re-evaluated if there was another round of funding to proceed? Well, Andy will pick up on that in a, a moment. I'll, I'll pick up on the, the, the broader question. I mean, the, the, TBOC is the executive's key strategy for, for uh, building a united community. Um, and the executive has, has uh, reaffirmed its commitment to that strategy in the, the New Deal and New Approach Agreement. Um, so uh, I think this is a question of where the funding comes from. Uh, ministers ha uh, uh, are in discussion with the Department of Finance about a range of things, including um, the, the ongoing funding for, 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 for this. In some respects, um, it's actually been, we, have, we have had greater certainty for this strategy over the last five years. Because it came from the, 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 the Fresh Start Agreement, it was guaranteed for five years. We actually had a figure guaranteed for this programme, which other programmes didn't have the benefit of. Mm. So it's been a boon to date. The problem is it's coming to an end uh, you know, next year. Uh, and uh, at the moment, what we're doing is flagging up to the Department of Finance that provision needs to be put in place for that. Um, and, and as I say, given it's a major executive priority and given it's, it's, it's been confirmed in the New Deal, New uh, Approach Agreement, uh, um, I would expect that that programme will, will continue. Okay. Now, obviously, there's always a little bit of uncertainty for those out in the voluntary community sector uh, around that, but um, it, as I say, it is a flagship uh, programme and, I, and I certainly I would expect it to continue. Um, do you want to pick up on the other aspect? Yeah, I think, Chair, what you may be referring to is TBOC Camps programme. Yeah. So the, the purpose of TBOC Camps is to bring young people together to obviously uh, meet others from the other community, but to build lasting relationships. So it's delivered right across many sectors, faith, uniformed organisations, registered EA groups, voluntary community sector. So it's, it's, it's widespread. Uh, but and there's been policy development in the TBOC camps from it just being the summer camps in terms of headline action to be something much more involved and talk about that if necessary. But in bringing groups together, it's quite artificial to have a group from Fermanagh and a group from Belfast if the objective is to create lasting friendships. So where possible, what we try to do is to partner groups who are close geographically in order that they can go away from the camp. There's a pre-camp activity, there's the camp itself, and then there's a post-camp activity, so that they can build on those friendships that they've created at the camp, uh, and creating attitudinal change in the camp itself, and then hopefully those friendships developing over time. So that's the reason for that criteria. Now, in terms of the programme rolling out for 2021, the assessment is ongoing at present. There's, I've seen of visibility of that uh, just today. There's good geographic spread in that, but that's what we're trying to address in terms of that, that geographic piece, Chair, in terms of ensuring groups can, can uh, take that, those relationships forward on a longer term basis. Okay. But would there be grounds for saying that not every group would be able to fulfil that? Because again, I know I'm, I, I'll maybe speak to you again uh, uh, because I'm thinking of a specific example, but really, if you're 20 miles from Belfast and you're living in a particularly predominant community, it's very difficult to find a group on your doorstep that is within that, but it doesn't mean that you can't have relations that are 20 miles down the road because, for example, the town I live in is quite used to flowing back and forward to Belfast. 20 miles doesn't mean much, and I'm sure many people in Fermanagh would think that going 20 miles is is no distance, whereas maybe somebody that lives in a city might think anything beyond four or five miles is quite and far. Beyond the city hall. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's just that, you know, it's the straight... Yeah, no, it's, it's possible, sure. No, yeah. it goes, if there's an opportunity... And, there's specific, there, and there is, and if there are specific groups that have an issue, we can look with the Education Authority about partnering them up, right. or and if it's at a, a, a distance more than, than, than local, that, that's still possible. Okay, mm -hmm. that's uh, But good. just on a generic yeah. basis... We try to keep them as close to you. I think, Chair, that purpose. one of the, the reasons for the policy, and of course we can look at it for specific circumstances, was uh, to avoid any sense that groups were, were partnering with everyone except the people who lived in their own community. And that what was important here was that relationships were built locally. And part of the, a key part of the development of the CAMS programme has, has been to, to ensure that the young people are visible, you know, um, 
uh, undertaking joint activities in their own community, and the other community, the others in the community see that happening. We think that's really, really important. But there can be exceptions, as you say, where it's difficult. So I think we can look at that yeah. particular exception. What we also do, uh, those who aren't geographically close, will bring camps together to camps in the community event three times throughout the year. So they're part of something much bigger than just their camp. Lots of camps will come together and see that they're part of a bigger piece. Uh, and those then develop social action projects from that. Again, they build a legacy back into their own communities. So they go back into their own communities, give a positive reflection of the youth in those communities and give back to the, the community. So that's been developed uh, just in, in terms of the camps programme. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Mike. Thank you, Chair. There was an issue I was going to raise in the finance issue uh, section, Mark, but you brought it up, and that's in terms of uh, redress to victims of historical institutional abuse. You quoted four variables, um, the number who remain, the number who come forward, the number who can prove they were abused, and the level of awards. Do you not accept there's a fifth variable? I wasn't being exhaustive in the, in the list, Mike. I'm sure that there, are, there are probably more variables than that. Well, I'm referring to um, recovering costs from the institutions who were responsible for the abuse. Well, um, so there's a couple of points to make about that. Um, the first thing is that ministers are keen uh, to engage with, inst with institutions and are making arrangements uh, um, to engage personally with the institutions around recovering um, some of, the, some of the costs and looking at a contribution from the institutions. We as officials have already been in touch with them to ensure we can get the necessary records that are in the institutions to enable uh, applications to be um, considered by the redress board or the, the information is in front of them. But I think there is another very important point here uh, as well, which is that um, the way the, the HIA was set up was as a publicly funded scheme. It was intentionally set up with a publicly funded scheme, and this was a key recommendation from Hart, uh, so that no one, no, no one who suffered in any of the institutions would be dependent on a contribution from institutions. So the public funding has to be guaranteed up front to ensure that anyone who comes forward and has a valid claim, which is substantiated uh, as part of the process, will receive the redress that they deserve. Any contribution from the institutions will then defray the overall cost of the public purse, but as yet we don't know what that uh, might be. Um, Which means so it's a variable, it and my argument is it should have been in your document. Now, I'm not sure if you were there, I know Gareth was, there was a meeting some months ago in Castle Buildings, uh, when the five parties agreed very strongly uh, that David Sterling should go back to the institutions, not least the Catholic Church, and make clear to them that we expected them to put their hands in their pockets, and to find much deeper pockets uh, than they did when this was resolved in the Republic of Ireland. Are you aware whether David Sterling had that discussion? David wrote to the institutions uh, making two points. One was about the compelability of information as to whether individuals have been in the institutions and that second point that you've just referred to, um, which is about the contributions uh, being made from the institutions and that there would be engagement with them. So he has made that contact, he has written to, to them. And as you say, in, in my comments I was responding orally to the question, so it wasn't an exhaustive list of variables. Mm -hmm. but the, the difficulty for us now is, yes, the, um, as part of the overall total cost, we will have to consider what a contribution from the institution might be. Uh, that is extremely difficult to try and estimate, and we're only at the very early stages of, of even thinking what that might be, but absolutely it is a very I, I, I accept that it's very difficult to estimate, and I just feel that it, it's such an important document as a briefing paper on budgetary pressures for the committee that it should have been in as one of the, one of the variables. Let's move, let's move back to the, to the seven uh, headline tea box. Um, the summer camps, you gave us the headline figures. I'm interested, what is demand versus supply like? In terms of the number of applications yeah. coming forward in camps, uh, and the numbers that are actually capable of being delivered, and have you ever said that we've been over oversubscribed, I think, haven't we? I've uh, been oversubscribed certainly this year. I'll be subject to the budget approval by, by ministers. Uh, in, in terms of the camps per year, we started off around 101 camps in 15 16, that's increased to 128 camps in 1920 this year. Uh, there's some camps wouldn't have been assessed as being strong enough or above the line, which weren't funded, but that's slightly increasing from 101 to 128, and we're oversubscribed this year. That'll be subject to budget confirmation. How many will fund in, in 2021? Do all seven have targets? All seven headline actions? Yes. 
Uh, as as articulated in the strategy, yes, so yes. 10 shared housing schemes, yeah, 100 summer camps, etc. So do you run a RAG-based risk assessment? We assess progress against all of the uh, the, the targets, yes, uh, on, on, on the, or the headline actions on the basis of the targets. Yes, we do. So any in the red? Well, um, the, uh, the shared... Uh, um, Campuses is one that is uh, a risk. Um, there were to be ten shared campuses. There are, there are five at various stages of development. That has proved to be difficult. The, the funding that we provide from the Billy United community is, is the revenue costs that are required to help the schools to work with each other, to work through how, how they would actually manage the campus and so forth. The capital funding has to come from elsewhere. And it was the, there has been pressure around the availability of that, that capital funding. Uh, it's also a long and slow process working with uh, the communities and working with boards of governors to get the agreement about, about what the, the, the actual uh, arrangements are around that. So that's one that um, where, where progress isn't as rapid as we would uh, <coughs> like it to be for a range of reasons. I think also in terms of the um, uh, removing all the interface uh, barriers by 2023, an extremely challenging target, probably the most challenging target. That is actually there among the headline actions for reasons which everyone around the table would understand and why there's been progress made on that. Uh, I think that certainly would be, if we were using a formal uh, uh, RAG status, that, that would be in that upper category. So, so too red as in not going to happen on time as we sit, sit today. Any, I'm not criticising, I'm just seeking the information. Any ambers? Um, we haven't formally gone through and done the, 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 the red amber uh, green uh, on them. Um, certainly, in, in, if we look at a, a number of them, in respect of the, uh, the camps, we have exceeded what's required in the camps. In respect of the urban villages, uh, we have exceeded what is required in terms of urban villages. In terms of the um, shared neighbourhoods, we have achieved the 10 shared neighbourhoods and moved on uh, um, beyond that. In respect of the 10,000 young people, um, the peace for youth um, is on target to bring in 7,400 when it completes, and the intention there would be to look at Peace Plus as a possible for a possible extension of that to try and get up to the 10,000 that would be required. I'm losing count of how many I've gone through now. That's four, I think, which have been achieved. In terms of sport, it was about having a, a comprehensive. Well, it wasn't a very clear target in the sense of, of, of numerically, but about having a, I think it was a significant program, um, and I think we do have a significant program there. So I would say that there, there are five which are being achieved and there are two that are, that are at risk uh, uh, of, of being fully achieved. Okay. The Regional Trauma Network um, arises under the Stormont House Agreement, paragraph 27, which was a political agreement to accept a recommendation from the Commission for Victims and <coughs> Survivors to bring forward a comprehensive mental trauma service. You'll be aware that there's now some dispute about whether this is a service for victims and survivors primarily, or whether it is a national health service open to all. How, how can we have that debate when it was brought forward specifically on the back of a recommendation from the Victims Commission? It would be ultra-virus for that commission to recommend something to the general public. Well, I mean, Gareth can, can come in uh, a bit on the, on the detail here. Um, the, the intention where, what there was, as, as, as I, I know you're very aware, was to ensure that victims and survivors would have access to the sorts of key service that they need. Um, the commitment was that it would operate within the NHS. Um, now, one of the key, the key uh, <coughs> principles on which the NHS is based is that it treats people on the basis of need regardless. Uh, and it, sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't focus and it doesn't prioritise particular groups. They're all... Uh, priorities on the basis of clinical need, and there are, of course, while victims have very significant issues, there are there are very uh, there's a whole range of groups in society which we, who who can and will present with significant mental health and other trauma-related issues to the national health service. So putting a service within the NHS um, means that it has to operate under on, under the the the, um, the basic principles of the NHS on the basis of clinical need. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that there won't be enhanced services for victims. There will be enhanced services for victims. They will be um, being treat, 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 treated. What there can't be is a, is, a, is a service which is specifically for victims and within the NHS. 
Mark Lee, who is leading for the Department of Health, told an all-party group this week that the Department of Health is seeking legal advice on this. Are you aware of what that legal advice is? Um, uh, the, the legal advice will be a matter for the, the Department of Health, but I think what I can say is that uh, the Department is considering all of these. The Department of Health is considering all of these issues. Um, but but that. Okay, uh, I asked you, are you aware of what that legal advice is? Chair, legal, advice, legal advice would be would, would be privy to the, the, the that particular department, privileged to that department. So be that, yeah, I think you'd have to ask that question of that department. Mark, I mean, we're supposed to be doing joined up government, and you were working here closely with the Department of Health mm -hmm. in terms of your own briefing. I, I think I think. No, I, no, you're saying you're not. You're saying there's a, there's a Chinese war. No, I'm I mean, saying. You can't have it both ways. No, no, I think, I think when I say we're working very clo closely, I, what I set out was what I understand to be the principles of the NHS and yeah, what the yeah, key yeah, issue is. I get that, but now I'm asking, I'm not asking precise. what the advice was, I'm asking you, are you aware of what the advice is? Uh, I haven't seen the advice itself, nor would I expect to, because... But are you aware? Uh, I, I have had a general indication of what the, uh, is in the advice. No, it didn't hurt. Thank you. Okay, and, and I take it, Mark, that... You have satisfied me that there is an issue here in terms of the purpose of the NHS and what that paragraph 27 is trying to do as far as I understand it and I was part of the negotiation. So there is an unresolved tension there that needs to be resolved. Mm -hmm. I simply wanted to know whether mm -hmm. that advice was out and whether both departments were working collaboratively and knew what the advice was. Thank you. Emma. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for your um, presentation. So, just following on from some of the things that Mike had been saying in terms of TBUC and I suppose the targets that were there. So, there, there's a commitment, obviously, then to to renew the funding past March of next year. So, I'm wondering, obviously, there are some um, ticks beside some of these targets and some that haven't quite been achieved. I, I, I wanted to ask a broader question about the, the learning that's come out of this phase and, and what could be, I'm assuming you would be having discussions about changes going forward and, and how some of these things would be addressed. I mean, I note the percentage of positive responses um, from, from the people that were involved, and I'm assuming that's young people, but 75% of respondents felt the programme had a positive role in bringing young people from different backgrounds together, which is obviously impressive but at the same time that means a quarter of, of people that were involved in a, in a scheme which was designed to bring young people from different communities together didn't feel that that had been effective so it's, it's a big there's a big gap there um yeah, i suppose over recent years uh, since the implementation of the programs we've been trying to get better at how we capture our outcomes to, to capture not only the many people are participating in the programs but what the impact <coughs> and attitudinal change has been uh, it's only in the last year 1819 was the first year that we were able to do that aggregated up to a program level so the sample uh, that you're referring to there is about 8,000 uh, participants there's, there's many more participants so we need to we need to get better at that next year in terms of how many uh, we're able to aggregate up the program level but in terms of evaluation what we're always doing is evaluating the effectiveness of each programme, be it the district council or the central or the planned interventions, and identifying those weaknesses and how we can address them. Across different programmes as well, we've called what we have, what is called uh, shared learning forums. So that's where we're bringing all the groups who are delivering, for example, central good relations or the district council good relations, to share best practice and to challenge each other on where improvements could be made or what's worked well or what could work better. So there's, there's a whole programme of evaluation of projects on a programme level and then shared learning within the sector uh, across, across delivery partners. So it's an ongoing piece of work and it will always be ongoing in terms of how we improve what the delivery is on the ground. If you can imagine there's in Central Good Relation, there's approximately 100 projects. In District Council, there's 141 projects, 128 camps. Uh, so a significant number of interventions going, around, uh, going uh, ongoing at any one time, and all with slightly different approaches and different design for different purposes. Uh, so it's trying to collate all that back and aggregate that at the programme level to learn the lessons and, and strengthen going forward. So do, do you have, then, a confirmed what is going to be spent 
following March of next year? Do you have a budget set out? Well, how, how the programmes are the TBUC generally has been resourced at present, as Mark reflected, was from baseline within the Executive Office and shared future funds. Shared future funds run out at March 21, so resource has yet to be identified for, for delivery beyond March 21. Okay. That's been worked on. As the pressure has been logged, that's right, that's part of the finance in that respect, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Christopher? Is there a working definition of what shared education is? Uh, yes, there is. In fact, it's, it's in legislation. Um, now, that's not, I mean, our programme, I think, may have predated the actual legislation around this, but there is um, uh, a, a responsibility on the Department of Education to promote Shared education, which interestingly goes beyond the um, responsibility that is required for um, encouraging and facilitating entry oh. education and encouraging and facilitating Irish medium education. So it's an additional responsibility. Now, for us, I think it's 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 young people. I haven't got a precise de definition uh, uh, in front of me, but it it would be young people coming together um, for uh, shared classes, uh, or uh, which you know could could be on either campuses. Um, but a shared campus takes you into different territory. Um, shared education is, is where you have a campus where the facilities are shared to a greater or lesser degree. It may be that some parts of the campus um, are particular to uh, uh, one of the sharing schools and there are some bits which are, which are common. Or it can be a campus which is completely um, shared. Um, okay. So there's a range, there's a, there's a spectrum in there. How much money was in the shared education pot in this stage? Uh, for the delivering social change, um, for the uh, the three further programmes that Mark mentioned, um, twenty five million for shared education. And how much of that went to the integrated sector? Uh, I don't have those figures. The, it would be a question for the Department of Education, but uh, we can certainly ask. Because I know that in my own constituency. Um, I think there's an ideal example of where actually a shared education project should go, where you have St Bernard's Primary School, Knockbreda Primary School, and Knockbreda Nursery School sitting in that sort of Knockbreda area within spitting distance of each other. And the Department of Education, in their infinite wisdom, have decided to undertake to put a massive integrated school beside Knockbreda Primary School with what I think will be serious consequences for Knockbreda Primary School. Now, if it's shared education, and my understanding is that the school that's going on the Knockbreda site, some of the money came from this pot, Forge Integrated, is that familiar? I'm familiar with Forge Integrated, yes. I'm not Did some of the funding for their project come from this? Um, I don't, I, not, well, we're sort, of, we're sort of mixing up two pots here. Yeah. There's the um, the T buck funding, which was there to encourage uh, a certain number of schools to come together. Forge would not have been a part of that. Then there's a, the much larger funding that was for the delivery social change program to encourage shared education programs from <coughs> existing schools. And I, I'm not aware of whether Forge uh, would have received any funding from that. Uh, it's just if you have the potential, and I mean I've pushed the Department of Education on this when we were down. You could have created a situation on that one site where I, I, I think Forge deserve and should get a new building. I mean, I'm speaking as a former governor of uh, Forge Integrated School. You could have had on the one site an integrated school, um, Catholic maintained school, and a controlled school. And in the middle of those three schools, you could have had a nursery school acting as the feeder school for the, the three schools, it was uh, ideal, but instead, the department, not your department, but I just think I'd be really interested to know how much of this shared education money was really rebranded or used because people assume that integrated and shared are the same thing and they're not. Um, so I, I would be interested to know how much of that money went to the integrated sector. Because it, it's a source of annoyance to me as well. Throughout my constituency, there are schools that may be a controlled primary school. But the fact of the matter is, because of the nature of my constituency, it's an integrated school. 
So you look at somewhere like Rosetta Primary School. You've kids from every conceivable background going there. Fain Street, it has 47 different languages spoken in it. But it's not, it's not, because it's not part of that one integrated sector, opportunities for, for, for funding seem to be lost to them. So I, I would like an answer on that in terms of just the shared education budget and how much of it went to the integrated sector. Um, well, I, well, what I can tell you in terms of the shared education uh, budget in relation to TBOOC, it wouldn't have gone to, to those schools because we have a list. I have a list here of the okay. schools who, who who have received funding, and, they, and th those schools have to respond to a call. To, so it's put out there; they respond to it. They have to bring forward the plans that they have to um, to share, and those are considered, and then they go forward for approval, and then it takes it forward to, to the next stage. There's also uh, then there was capital funding that was made available along, along with uh, uh, funding for, for, for shared housing from the Treasury. Um, and there was some funding that was made available there for projects in, in, involving uh, both sharing and integrated uh, uh, education. And I think there was quite a significant amount there went to integrated schools, existing in, in yes. integrated schools. And the fact that that budget has been used up is one of the problems that there is in terms of moving forward with the shared campuses. Um, program in TBA because that capital funding is no longer available. Yes, and I mean that's where it's a source of real annoyance to me because in terms of we have missed the shared campus target and I could see in my own constituency, big site, it used to be not really high school, big site where you could have actually created a shared campus and, and helped to, to, um, to, towards delivering on that target. Was it a mistake, do you think, to put a date of 2023 on the removal of interface barriers. I mean, I was born in Annadale, but spent a big part of my childhood. We lived in Cloon Place at an interface. And I'd just be interested to know, how are we going to measure community confidence to, that allows those barriers to be removed? Because ultimately, it's all, well, <coughs> it's all well and good for civil servants or for government departments run by people that don't live in interfaces. To say by 2023 all of these walls should be down or all of these interface issues should be dealt with but unless the people that live on either side of those interfaces are content to go down that road it's not going to happen is it well the, uh, any change in any of these areas absolutely requires the consent of the community and can okay. only go as fast as the community is prepared to go in relation to the target, the target was set by the executive. It's, uh, you know, as, as, as part of its overall strategy, you can argue um, about whether having a target helps as a spur to action and mm. focus minds, or whether it's unrealistic. And there will be different views on that. But we work with what we're given from Absolutely. ministers. So the 2023 target was there, and it's DOJ who took that forward on our behalf. But certainly the work around and in, in, interfaces. I mean. Um, all the work is in the preparation. It's in the it's in the, it's in the working with the communities to build the confidence to try and um, um, get get uh, um, involved across the different communities to allow for some changes to be made. And these changes uh, can can come in a range of ways. It can be totally removing the structure. It can be reducing the structure mm. where it's very high, make it smaller, um, or make it more open where it's been a solid fence. You can make it a more open fence. All mm. of which can make actually quite a significant difference. Um, there can be reclassification, um, and there can be re-imaging, um, which are so the, the, there's almost like a spectrum. But yeah. ultimately, of course, there's 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 removal. Um, and just to, to go to your point, when we talk about um, how the difficulties that there are around this, um, there's a piece by Avila Kilmurray in in the uh, in the IFI uh, magazine. Uh, she makes the point that. 70% of all conflict-related deaths occurred within 500 yards of a peace wall, and 85% of killings within 1,000 yards. Um, so these are communities that have suffered quite significantly during the Troubles, and that's obviously why they, those interfaces are there. And they're also many in, in very deprived communities, so a lot of work has to be done to try and rebuild the confidence. And I think there's some positive signs coming through in some of the, the um, surveys that they've been doing, you know, there's, uh, the, the figures that they have got are suggesting that 76% of people said they would like to see the walls removed in their children's or grandchildren's lifetime. So longer term, they want to see them removed. In terms of those who would want them removed now, um, the latest figure was 19%. Now that's increased over two years from 13%. So I think there's a desire in the longer term to see them removed. I think there's, there's, there's 
greater progress uh, in terms of communities being, being prepared to see them removed now, but it is a difficult pro uh, process and it has to take account of where the community is. Uh -huh. It's probably also important to say none of these things sit in isolation from the other. You know, so what we would try to do with the District Council Good Relations Programme or Central Good Relations or CAMPS, for example, is to try and, uh, you know, join the dots in terms of building capacity and building confidence of communities in the round interfaces. So if you bring the children together across community activities and there's attitudinal change there that can have an impact on communities and on parents, and start to build that confidence when, and only when communities feel safe they're engaged in those conversations then so it's it's a journey and, and different communities at different interfaces are, are different places in that journey but nothing's in isolation it's not just the removal of of interfaces and it's about taking down a barrier mm. it's much more complex obviously as you'd appreciate and how do you how do you measure how the sort of I mean, do you literally physically just ask the people in the world who live alongside the walls, or how do you measure sort of community confidence that would allow them to come down? There, there is face-to-face -face engagement with, with communities, mm -hmm. uh, those closest to the interface and, and then wider uh, beyond the interface themselves. So there's an engagement team from DOJ right in the ground, we work also with, with IFI, uh, other statutory partners and, and uh, core funded groups from CRC, for example, the Belfast Interface Project. So mm. there's there's many conversations going in there and, and different levers and having those, but face to face consultation and building uh, confidence of those communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some survey work, obviously, at evidence and some of the, the percentages Mark was referencing. That's grand. Can I just take you back very briefly, Chair, and I yes. appreciate your indulgence. Can I just take you back in terms of the shared education piece? The capital figures, you wouldn't told them, I get them from. Department for Education? Uh, yes, there was, I, think, I, think, I think it was a figure of somewhere in the region of 500 million was made available from the Treasury at one point for the whole range of, of, of shared housing and shared education programmes, but that money is now all, all committed, um, yeah. including for things like the Strula campus and, 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 and for other uh, I mean, major, major programmes. My concern was basically that the Department for Education, in the absence of a minister in ministerial direction, determined to get the money spent, just thought shared, well, it's close to integrated, we'll just <coughs> go there with it. But I'll, I'll speak to them for those figures. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, Fran? Chair, sure. and it's just following on from what Christopher says. I, I live in an area um, that represent uh, an area where the longest interface in the north is uh, from Larnock Way to Townsend Street. And uh, I have to say that and I, I have worked with the Department of Justice on a number of schemes and I think the replacement of the gates at Townsend Street, at uh, North Hard Street and, and at Workman Avenue. And I think it has made a change there in terms of softening the, 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 the intimidatory nature of the, the, the gates in the, in, the, in the past. But, but like Christopher, you know, I've always held the idea that the, the, the people who live on the other side of the interface are the people you need to convince that the walls are not necessary. The, the waiter you bring it, and I think CRC have done this, the waiter you do it, uh, that the, the, the opinion of people uh, some miles away has an impact on mm. the thing. And the removal of a wall or a gate uh, at a, a particular time could set you back 40 years. So it, it needs to be done uh, with, with the, some thought. I'm not saying that that doesn't uh, take place. I've also always believed that uh, the walls are the, the, the public manifestation of division. Uh, but the, uh, the real enemy that we need to tackle and defeat is sectarianism. And uh, when, when we can crack that nut, then you can start to, to, to deal with uh, some, some, some of the, the, the other uh, stuff that is there. So I would impress upon it. And I do understand that it is really difficult. Uh, the 2023 is just around the corner mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, and it, it would be difficult. But I do believe the softening of, of many of the interfaces have worked, and I think that that, that, that has uh, played a role in it. I think that uh, just mo moving on from uh, that, uh, I uh, had the interface barriers. Uh, one of the ones was the, the TPOC executive action in relation to technical paramilitarism, and in particular B4, uh, that uh, the and the community element of it, it's only got off the ground, and yet it's supposed to finish in March, uh, March next year. 
Mm -hmm. uh, what plans are there uh, to ensure the continuation of that? I have to say that I have been concerned for a considerable period of time when I took part in a lot of the consultation with some of the communities and the officials from uh, the, 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 the department that uh, the, the community element, element of it was handled badly. I think the consultations were terrible, some of them. I think the answers uh, that were given to many of the questions uh, were, were, uh, were untruths. I think that uh, many people uh, that you had encouraged to take part in these consultations left uh, with, uh, and, and felt that there had been bad faith. I think that uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the whole aspect of it, whether it was B2, B4, or whatever, uh, what you ended up with uh, was the likes of uh, Department of Education, the PSNA, the Housing Executive, and others who immediately uh, upon this becoming available uh, were able to tap into the funding the thing. But again, the community waited four years of hard work. Uh, with the department and uh, the, 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 the difficulty. So, uh, is there, uh, uh, could we get an update of, of where that's at, uh, how it's been handled, and what plans there are for future funding? Yeah, I think that's going to be picked up at the next session, but I'm happy to say some words about it now, um, yeah. because, because I have, have been involved in that. Um, the whole, uh, uh, the, the tackling, paramilitary, tackling paramilitary criminality and organised crime, to give us full title, uh, um, Program is is headed by DOJ, and within that, <coughs> there are a range of departments have responsibility for certain parts of it, and we have responsibility for B4, as you describe, which is communities in transition. Um, and I think um, the, 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 in looking at how uh, or the funding was provided of ten million pounds a year, five million from the treasury, five million from the executive funds, um, and the treasury were very focused on the money being spent in year. They've since provided a little bit of flexibility at times, but the money had to be spent in year. So when that program was set up, um, it needed to um, have the capacity to spend almost immediately. What that meant was that those projects that were ready to go uh, and those areas of the program that could spend um, were able to bring forward programs very quickly. Um, and those that needed to have the community consultation, have the discussion with the community about, about what the things were that they wanted couldn't come, up, come in immediately. Um, so the initial spend did tend to be focused, as you say. Uh, uh, there was an element around um, support for the, the, the PSNI and, and other, uh, the task force. Um, but there was also a number of community programs that were um, delivered through, for example, DFC. Um, the, the, the training programs for women were, were delivered. The B4, but the eight areas that were identified, first of all, they had to be identified. Then there was the work and, and consulting with the community about what it was they actually wanted. Then we ran into the whole issue about whether or not decisions could be made. The whole Buick issue, could civil servants make decisions or not? And that took between six and nine months out of the programme because no one would engage. The political parties wouldn't engage uh, at that point in time and uh, wouldn't support the, commun the community consultation that was going on. So that put a delay in. But the point... To go to, go to the, the end of this, there was £12 million pounds was identified as being potentially capable of being uh, made available for, or specifically for B4. Um, of the projects that we have identified over the next 18 months, in the end, uh, when the programme is supposed to come to an end, um, there's, there'll be £8.5 million of projects, and they're already out and being procured, and most of those, uh, the, the, the majority of those have been procured, a number of them have already started, and I can give you the detail, and you'll get the detail in the next hearing. Um, there's also been the commitment in NDNA because our view was, given the time taken, the very point that you're making, given the time taken for consultation, you have to give these programmes time to have an impact on the ground. They need to be given time to make a difference, and it's important that the programme is extended. Now, there's a commitment in the NDNA to um, um, keeping the focus on, tackling these, these kinds of issues, uh, and there's discussions ongoing um, with um, the British government about, about the funding of that, and we, we would hope and expect the programme will be extended, which means that the eight and a half million I refer to will there will be opportunity after that for further funding to come in, in in the years after. So these projects will go on beyond, we hope and expect they will go go on beyond the eighteen months. But at the minute in our procurement what we've been able to say is these projects will go to this point and subject to availability of funding of the possibility of extension beyond that. And if the money comes we'll be able to run them on through. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, 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 that update, and as I say, uh, right fr from the get-go, 
I had done out in Corrigan uh, groups, certainly in constituency, the thing uh, uh, to 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 buy and it, uh, to put a thing. And at an early stage, groups were told uh, you need to come up uh, with proposals that could ban the thing. And on a number of occasions, when they went in, now these are people who are professional people in terms of their community, uh, their, their 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 community work over the years. Uh, they know what they're dealing with, and then they were told on a number of occasions. Well, that we've been to, to, we, the, 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 they've been told that no, we have to go back and, and try another route. Uh, and like now, sat in consultations where this was relayed, and what you ended up doing at that stage was losing people who had some confidence in the process at the start, and then uh, and then losing it. You said about you had to go down other avenues in terms of like in, in DFC. There was one proposal there where a group came in, and I think it may have been an American group, uh, that said they would go out and talk to the community, talk to the community about what they want in terms of, of things, which was a waste of space. You know, the communities were saying, uh, who are they? What do they represent? Who do they reflect? We have been working in this area for years and years and years, and they were just completely ignored. And as a matter of fact, most people in DFC didn't even know that uh, that, that, that that was going on. So as I say, there, 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 there was problems all the way through that whole consultation process. Well, they, there, there were problems and difficulties, uh, and, and, and there were others beyond the ones that you've just described uh, um, in terms of community consultation. Um, what actually happened was there was an initial analysis of all the areas. Key issues that came up were identified as priorities, and then there was discussion with the groups about well, what would be the projects that should come forward to deal with those priorities. Um, and then when they were identified, they were procured, they're out now at the moment, and groups have, have applied for them, and a, a significant number have been awarded. So yes, it took longer, and I accept it took longer than people would have, would have, would have wanted. But, but there is a key point here, uh, and when we talk about community development, um, all our experience from elsewhere, and what we get in all the uh, audit office reports, and what the best advice is, is that if you want to have um, um, projects which are going to be effective in the longer run, you have to take the time to work with the community to do that and to work out what is actually required and then to come up with proposals that reflect what the community want. Then you'll get the buy-in. And that was why we took the time up front. And as I said, it was interrupted by other, by other factors, but uh, um, we have had good applications in for the, the projects that, that we have put out. They have been awarded and they're starting to deliver in those um, communities. The other point I would make is it hasn't been easily, easy in some areas to get people to come out to consult on tackling paramilitarism for fairly obvious reasons. What does that tell you? Um, it tells you that people are afraid. It tells you, uh, now in some areas it, it was less difficult, in other areas it was very marked. Um, and it meant that when we were um, trying to have these consultations, we couldn't get the people to um, find out what their views were. Now then groups came to us and said, if you organise a particular event here, or you organise a particular event there at that point, then you'll be able to get people will come along. We had to have a lot of extra events in some particular areas. So it took longer in some areas than in others to be able to get to people in the community to find out what it was they actually, they actually want. And this is an ongoing issue uh, around the whole area. Not everyone is prepared to engage openly in the programme because of the um, the concerns that they would have um, um, in terms of their, their own personal position. So there were difficulties around that, but we've managed to get through that, uh, and the programme is rolling out, and I accept what you say about the time it took, but I think when we bring you the figures, and I haven't got them with me today because I wasn't expecting to get into detail today, but when we bring you the figures at the next meeting, you'll see that the procurements are out, they're being delivered on, on the ground. They will all be procured by the end of, by the end of March. And they will run through the end of the programme, and we're hopeful that a number of them, where it makes sense to keep them going, will be able to continue beyond that, provided the funding's there. Thank, thank you, Fat. But the, the other one in terms of B2, which was uh, specifically an action there uh, to deal with uh, the end of discrimination against political prisoners. And that was that. Are you talking about the FIDO uh, yeah. uh, legislation? Uh, we're um, we've had some initial discussions with ministers, and we'll be bringing proposals to ministers around that. Okay. Okay. Uh, two more speakers. Um, George. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Thanks uh, to you for the presentation. Um, my questions are on page 15. Uh, established 10 shared education campuses, and wondering where the, the five were, and what else. Just ask another question while I'm here. 
establish ten new shared housing schemes. And again, where? Pick up the hand. <clears throat> in terms of the shared education campuses, first, yes. uh, in terms of there's been three calls. Uh, so in terms of the five, they're ongoing at present. Limavadi Shared Education Campus, that involves St Mary's High School, Limavadi and Limavadi High School. Uh, and that includes the creation of two new shared facilities. George with a shared sixth form careers media and drama centre uh, and STEM centre at Limavadi High School. Uh, the second one is the Bally Castle shared education campus. Post-primary school project involves Bally Castle High School and Cross and Passion College. And the third project is Moy, uh, and that proposes a single 11 class be a school build to accommodate both the schools St John's Primary School, Moy and Moy Regional Primary School. And then Brookborough Shared Education Centre, and that's St Mary's Primary School, Brookborough and Brookborough Primary School, come together to seek the to single school build that will come to both schools, facilitate their shared education learning. And then the fifth one, the last one, is Dunneen, uh, Tim Bridge and Money Nick Primary School, Randallstown, co-locate a single school build that will come to both schools whilst, whilst allowing for shared facilities. Uh, so that's the first two calls and the five projects that are then live. Mm -hmm. yep. In terms of ten shared neighbourhoods, George, the, the first one's in Balnafoy Close and Ravenhill Road, and East Belfast. Second, South Belfast. Oh, yes, you're right, South Belfast says East <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, the Global Crescent in, in uh, Ravenhill, Ravenhill Avenue, again, South Belfast, despite the fact it says here East Belfast also. Um, we ask the people that live there where they're from, they'll say they're from East Belfast. Uh, all right. Uh, Burnville Crescent um, in Cookstown, um, Mans Road in Crossgar, Felden in Newton Abbey, uh, Main Street in Drum, Market Road in Ballymena, uh, Antrim Road in Balnahinch, Tremor Street in Banbridge, and the Embankment in Balnafai, uh, also in South Belfast. Thanks very much. Okay, um, Pat is next, but um, so supplementary to that. Yeah, supplementary to that point, if Pat's okay with that, and um, quickly. In, in relation to your response to uh, Andy to to George, you're referring to the schools, and obviously everybody else is interested in their constituents. I do mine today. Denine and um, money next. Money, money next. Yeah. Money next primary school. Yeah. Is there money spent there yet, Andy? There's money in terms of the tea book allocations. What that money is to do is to release the leadership teams and staffing. You know, so it's resource money uh, in in relation to having those discussions between the schools. It's not it's not the capital element. Yeah. So in terms of the tea book money, that's what the resource is there. So yes, there has been money spent in that. In respect of that. So, so I'm not going to try. And, I'm not going to try and poo poo the suggestion because I mean I think it was a good idea in terms of the two schools. But what does concern me in terms of the advancement of these schemes, we're getting, I mean, in, in reference to your answer about setting up these, these structures, mm -hmm. there's no plans drawn up, there's no site identified. So, if, I mean, I think if you actually ask the public's opinion on that, it's been a waste of money. I mean, what they've done, both schools took big challenges and leaps of faith to encourage their parents to go in a particular direction, which was the right thing to do for both communities. What I think if you went back and asked them today, I don't believe they'll have confidence because nothing has materialised on the back of that. The schools are working together, they're collaborating well together, there's still no site identified, no plans, and what's actually happening as a result of that, the numbers will define the numbers will continue to drop. Lose confidence. Yes. Yeah, I suppose it's a long process in terms of any school build and, and around shared education importance but, building but, the confidence. And it shouldn't be because the whole purpose of those shared campuses was schools were which were becoming unviable in their own right. So Money Night was becoming unviable, Nain was becoming unviable, both from separated communities and there was an opportunity to bring the two communities together on a single campus. Okay, can but, I but to, 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 to bring it up to that stage and then do nothing? Yeah, you're now on a supplementary to the supplementary to the supplementary. Oh, so right. we've been generous and Pat is waiting. So Pat, I'll ask you to continue. We can, from the I think you've, you've, made a, you've made your point and I think you, you can get a reply, but after we Thanks, Chair. Uh, and just coming in on uh, the shared housing developments, um, yeah, it's been well doc documented that there have been some problems around uh, some of those developments anyway. So could you tell me what is being done to protect those uh, occupants who have felt intimidated or who feel under pressure uh, is the uh, is the department or in conjunction with the with DOJ and the police have they taken any action to ensure this type of intimidation is dealt with 
Well, um, a couple of, of, of aspects of that. Some of the issues that shared neighbourhoods encounter are no different to the sorts of issues that other neighbourhoods will encounter, and some of the, the difficulties that there are in dealing with those apply equally to shared neighbourhoods as they do um, elsewhere. Um, <coughs> anyone who, who um, commits to being part of a shared neighbourhood has to sign up to a charter which sets out how they will behave and if they breach the charter there's, there's the potential there for them to be asked to uh, leave the, um, the, the neighbourhood scheme. Uh, some of the other learning that there has been around, um, for example, Global Crescent and some of the issues there uh, has been that it's important to focus not just on the shared neighbourhood but on the community around it um, to and, and, and there are good relations plans that are that, that are funded and work being supported uh, so that there's what's called bonding programs uh, and bridging programs so the bonding is really about the residents of the new development to give them a sense of community and uh, that they all belong to uh, a community which has which has particular aspects to it and then the bridging is to try and make connections between that neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhood um, because there can be difficulties there sometimes when there are new houses, for example, being put in an area and other people don't have access to brand new shiny houses. It can create tensions uh, and there needs to be something, you know, how does the neighbouring community benefit? So there's funding made available as part of these shared neighbourhood schemes to support a good relations plan over, over a, a number of years to try and develop those connections both within the community and across the community. I think some of the other issues that you're referring to, whether it comes down to intimidation or flags or so forth, some of those will be dealt with by the FIT Commission and are not something that can be dealt with by the, by the shared neighbourhood uh, uh, scheme actually in itself. But, but the other point uh, I would make, I think, is in some areas um, there's pressure on housing and it's highly political, as you'll know yourselves, uh, and, this, and this can create difficulties. And I think there we need to have um, all representatives, both local political rep representatives and others who are working with those communities to try and maintain good relationships and defuse any tensions that actually arise. So this is this work for all of us, I think, in, in this. It's not easy. <coughs> I think there's about £5 million allocated to those 10 T-Box schemes. And then the, the 10 T-Box schemes that has been mainstreamed at DFC, their Housing for All programme, so as yet further schemes have been developed good relations support to those as well so it's not just building them and that's it done the bonding and bridging programs that mark so mark explained that one day like it's, it's like that like the health service in terms of you don't get everybody better and that's it this is an ongoing piece of work ongoing building community relations ensuring those communities within themselves and beyond themselves uh, continue to to strengthen Okay, th thanks for that. I just want to move on to some of the stuff we dealt with last week in relation to the, the victims' uh, payments or the victims' pensions. Uh, it's commonly called the victims' pensions, but I'm, I'm not sure what is the Victims' the, payments. Victims' payments. And in, in terms of any payments that might be made, uh, are, are they all going to be lump sums or are they going to be instalments over... Well, particular period, or yeah. what way is it going to work? That's a matter of, of for anyone who, who, who qualifies for this, it's a matter for choice for them when they reach the age of 60. They can choose to have the um, remaining payments all rolled up into 10 years' worth as a lump sum, <coughs> and that's it finished. Uh, or they can continue to take um, an, an annual payment beyond that, but that's a decision for each each individual, which is one of the variables in here yeah. uh, about, about about how many do we think will actually go for that option, or how many might want the ongoing payment. And uh, uh, is it pension then and everything, but name or it's, it's not going to be taxable, I take it. It's not taxable. No, no. Um, it's 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 um, it's identified as uh, a payment to provide acknowledgement and recognition to victims who were injured through no fault of their own. That's the um, description that the, the Secretary of State gave to it. OK, and um, given that uh, it was Westminster who made these regulations, but they're, they're going to be administered by uh, the executive office, are there any other examples of regulations like this uh, being made at Westminster and having to be administered by uh, an executive department? I would have to have to have to look to, to see if that's the case. Um, I would be surprised if it wasn't, but um, I would need to go and, and check on? that. To and, and, and just that's the case. Just, just in terms of the the development of this scheme, 
and uh, I know you had an issue last week about the, the term engagement, uh, but can you walk me through the role that the <coughs> department had when the NIO was trying to develop this scheme? Because there was some contact of some sort between yourselves, uh, DOJ and the NIO. Well, what what yeah. form did that contact take? Well, um, the, first of all, the, the, this came in, as you, as, as you note, in an amendment of the EFEF Act. Um, and um, it was set with very clear time frames for regulation by the end of January and implementation by the end of May. Um, so once we knew the EFEF Act uh, um, had, had gone through and work was starting on the regulations, uh, we asked the well, who is going to deliver this? And when we looked at it, we realised as, as a devolved issue, it was going to be for our, for our, our department. So um, we established uh, an oversight group um, of victims panel, which I chair, um, and which has representation from a range of departments, including NIO, uh, on it, so that we could try and understand what was proposed in the consultation document. Um, and what would be required uh, in terms of delivery, so we could start to do some of the preparations while the regulations were being developed. So we would had, I think, their monthly was it monthly meetings, uh, uh, Gareth, around this, uh, and we started. Well, what are the sort of issues that are going to come out of this in order that we can make some sensible preparations? Um, and we were we were um, um, looking at things like like the IT, looking at well, which department is is going to do this? What might the the potential cost be, um, what format might it all take, who would be included, who wouldn't be included, but it was very difficult to do because the regulations hadn't yet been been put in place and the consultation wasn't in place. So we were trying to make whatever preparations we could make uh, without certainty over what the, the, the policy was because the policy was a responsibility of NIO and, as I said last week, the decisions to be taken on that were the responsibility of the Secretary of State. So we were trying to make as best preparations as we could without that certainty or that clarity over what the, the policy was actually going to be. So we would have had a regular contact in that regard. But the um, final decisions uh, around this, the management of the consultation, that was all responsibility of NIO, and we weren't privy to those uh, final decisions because that is, was the responsibility of the Secretary of State. And, and uh, you say in the paper that we have today that officials raised a number of drafting and technical points. What, what would those points have been? Do you want to pick up on some of those? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they really were drafting and, and technical points. Um, it was where um, really a particular topic was, was dealt with, and uh, we were saying, well, that covers A and B. We also need to provide C, um, or um, you know, we, we were asking a question about something that had been um, mentioned in the consultation. How is that reflected in the the regulations? Um, I mean, it, it 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 was at that level of very technical how things are drafted, how words are used <coughs> at, a, at a policy level. And did the issue of the 2006 order ever come into those discussions? Um, the, certainly the NIO was, was aware and uh, when we had these discussions um, we referred to the 2006 order and the difference between it and what was in the, uh, in the consultation paper, yes. Um, but um, observing that there was that, that, there was that difference. Um, of course, the the difference um, goes back to the Executive Formation Etc. Act and goes back to the amendment that Lord Hayden and others uh, brought. Um, so the uh, the difference was in the in the primary legislation um, before the NIO started any any work on regulation. Yeah, uh, but I, I suppose the point I'm making is that. Uh, this, these particular regulations are not consistent with the 2006 order uh, and was there any discussion around that and was the potential uh, for a legal objection to the regulations discussed? Well, the, the, um, the difference between the, the definition in, in the order and what was uh, intended by the victim's payment was quite clear from the outset. I mean, it was an explicit 
uh, element of, of discussion uh, in, in Westminster whenever uh, um, Lord Hayne was bringing forward his, his amendments. So that was explicit from, from the outset. It wasn't something that we needed to raise. That was there right from the outset. And certainly it would have been made in the consultation by various groups uh, in responding to it. I, I imagine, I haven't seen the no. detail, I imagine they would have raised that particular issue. But this whole issue about the definition of the victim and what victims' payments was going to cover was right at the heart of this issue from the outset, and it was public from the outset, so uh, it wasn't something that we had to raise. It was implicit in the actual yes. uh, announcement that, that that was made. And, and are you saying that uh, the regulations trump the 2006 order? It's not a question of one trumping the other. I think it's a question of uh, the definition of a victim is used for certain things in terms of providing support for services, and in terms of making payments to victims, this acknowledgement um, and recognition to victims, the way the regulations are drafted, they have a different they have a different scope. The eligibility is different. But in terms of the other work that the executive office is doing uh, through the victim strategy, the services that are being provided by the victims and survivors service and so on, those are all still on the basis of the 2006 definition. Uh, and was the issue of a legal challenge discussed at all? By the department, you mean? In any of the discussions that took place that the department were involved in? I mean, the, 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 the department would only act under the um, advice and guidance of ministers, so uh, we, we, we didn't have ministers at that point, so we wouldn't have taken a legal challenge. Did, did, uh, did, did, that, did that, that would have been for mm, others to take. Did the department take any legal advice around it? Again, the department wouldn't have been in a position to take legal advice around that. We would act under the direction of ministers. In this case, we didn't have ministers. Mm. So, I mean, well, I suppose the point is, I mean, are you saying there's absolute legal clarity here that the 2006 order is of no consequence here at all? I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm not qualified to say that. What I can well, say... Well, that's why I'm asking you if you took legal advice. But I'm not sure that's for me to take legal advice in this instance. This is, this is essentially a political matter. Um, it, 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 it emanated in... At, at Westminster, we act under the, under the direction of ministers. So when uh, Parliament uh, sets the legislation in place and says what the intent of the legislation is, we act to that. Uh, if ministers want to change it, it would be up to ministers to change it. It's not something that we as civil servants would do. We act under the direction and control of ministers. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for... Um, your presentation and particular questions, the substantial questions. Um, I appreciate that. And um, I'm, there are a number of issues that we will uh, no doubt come back to you in the future. Um, one certainly would be looking at a briefing on the HIA to include the details of the engagement with institutions. I think we've, at uh, that point, has been raised uh, on several times over the last few weeks. I think maybe we'll do a separate briefing on that, but the um, clerk will. Uh, Liaise with the, the day load to, to get that arranged at some point in the future, but we'll appreciate it. Thank you for that. I know you're going to yes. do a change do, over there. Change, and yeah. okay, okay. We'll just take ease for about 30 seconds to allow me to get a coffee. Sure. <laughs> <Just an> important <laughs> bit. Everybody else. So we can 
Recommence, market yourself again. I'm Peter, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed for coming along um, for this session, which is the briefing on the budget. And I know that we had asked uh, some additional information. I know that some additional information have been provided, an additional report. Um, so if we maybe let yourselves give our a short presentation uh, and then we'll move on to the questioning. And whilst I certainly don't want to um, curtail questioning, um, I'm sure members are aware that we're, we're well into our third hour of this meeting and we're now about to discuss <laughs> a budget, so it's hardly the most exciting subject. But maybe whenever the members get to the questions, we'll try and try and get as many of the questions out in the first go and then a quick supplementary afterwards and then we can move around because it can be difficult for members if you're the seventh or the eighth that's asking questions and people have had a long time to ask but we'll move through those as quickly as we can so we'll pass on to yourselves then to give us a short presentation okay thanks chair i i, I will be brief then because we did touch on some of these issues yeah. l last week and i don't want to go through everything you've got the paper uh, there point to make we have additional pressures because of additional responsibilities we've taken on over the last uh, uh, five years and because of the combination of budget cuts over the, the last um, five, five years. So that's where the pressure on our baseline budget uh, is coming from. We've been able to address that for the last three years because we haven't had to meet the cost of ministers and spas and all the other associated costs and that's been a allowed us to plug some of these gaps but now with the executive back we don't have that luxury anymore and these, these pressures are really coming home um, to, to bear. Um, So we have pressures also around our executive central funds where we need ongoing um, funding to meet our contractual commitments, for example, example around the Delivering Social Change programme, um, where we need funding to uh, meet the remaining commitments around the Social Investment Fund, around the Early Intervention Transformation programme uh, and uh, around the uh, Dementia Signature programme. Um, we also re we referenced earlier <coughs> the... Um, Importance and it is a year down the track of making sure that the, the good relations uh, funding is maintained at £12 million pounds per year. Um, there's reference also in the paper to um, the, uh, the funding coming from the Tackling Power Mil Militarism, Criminality and Organised Crime uh, uh, programme. Uh, for B4 and communities in transition that we discussed, but we expect that that will be bid for by the Department of Justice and will come through to us from the Department of Justice as we're acting um, under, under their lead in that, um, in that regard. Uh, we touched again earlier on HIA, so I'll not say much more um, and, than to just repeat some of the pressures we think we face, and, and, and there is a, a large degree of uncertainty around these. We think these range from, at the lower end, 149 million to potentially 402 million, which is our central planning assumption, up to a potential 668 million, although we think that that's unlikely. Um, they can't be absorbed by the department's existing budget and they need to be met centrally from block funds. In relation to victims' payments, many of the same uh, issues uh, apply. Um, uh, and our cost, and I do want to clarify the cost estimate because there was some media uh, um, um, uh, reporting uh, last week suggesting there was a difference between the figures that the First Minister quoted around this and the figures that I quoted. Um, we believe that in 2021 the cost will be somewhere in the region of between 25 and 60 million, and that was the figure the First Minister referred to. When I was here last week, I referred to a figure for the financial planning horizon over three years, where we reckon the figure is around 109 million. So one was for one year and the other was for three years. Mm -hmm. Now, what we don't have is the, um, the total costs, and we talked about that a wee bit earlier. We're working on a business case to try and, and, and work through what those costs uh, might, might be, but we can be, expect them to be significantly in excess of that $109 million. Um, <clears throat> In terms of EU future relations, we have received funding to help us with our, co our central coordinating role uh, on that. Um, and going forward, we will need to ensure that that funding is, uh, continues to be provided. That's provided outside our normal baseline by the Department of Finance and the, the, the requirement there is in the region of about 2.8 million in 2021. In terms of um, <coughs> capital, um, we need the capital to be able to complete um, our uh, existing commitments around uh, urban villages uh, and our expectations around uh, Ebrington, um, the ongoing development there, uh, HIA and uh, Maze Long Cash. Uh, 
And there's also a line in there that some people may have picked up on the IFRS 16 leases, um, which Peter always explains to me. And this is really capitalising of the uh, the lease cost. So instead of having a revenue stream, they're capitalised up into a lump sum, and that meets the cost going forward. So that's a new approach, uh, and means that, that those those lease costs are a capital rather than a revenue expenditure. Right. Describe that correctly. Um, <coughs> we've also, uh, in a number of areas, uh, highlighted some areas where we could potentially do do more if there was agreement and if the funding was available, and that would be around the potential for some additional urban village areas if ministers agreed to that. Um, and other than that. I, 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 well, yes, of course. The other additional thing then is the um, potential additional costs arising out of the New Deal, New Approach. Um, and again, we have we have some additional responsibilities that have fallen to the department around establishing an Office of Identity and Cultural Expression um, and appointing an Irish Language Commissioner and an Ulster British Commissioner. And again, this will be something we're going to do in more detail in our next session in a couple of weeks' time. Um, we also have responsibility for the Commissioners for Ministerial Standards for their, for, for their appointment. Uh, for establishing a compact civic advisory panel and for um, identifying Bill of, Bill of Rights experts to assist the executive or the, sorry, the assembly subcommittee uh, on that. So our costs around that, and these are only estimates put in to make sure there's some provision made, are in the region of, um, in 2021, uh, just over 6 million, 6.3 million, uh, rising uh, uh, to 11.9 in 2021, 22, and 11.4 in 2022, 23. Again, those are estimates which would be prone to change whenever decisions are made by ministers. I think that's all I'd like to say, Chair. I'm happy to take uh, any, any questions if there are. Great. OK, thank you very much. Well, maybe just to start on the questions with two, uh, I'll put them together. Number one uh, is the fact that the, the departmental budget seems to be in around 50-something million, but the departmental spend seems to be about 670 million. Um, it's just to get the, the difference between um, those two figures in terms of what, what is the near 60 million and how does it go up to 660 and, and what, what crosses over in there um, and whenever you are applying for the estimates going forward you've applied I think for um, in, in the, the vote on vote and account um, you've, it's 57 million that you've applied for but again it's normally 45% of your budget that you would apply for for that so 57 million isn't 45% of your overall budget, if I'm correct. Um, and then, as this is tidying up the, the, the spring supplementary estimates, tidies up a bit of the monitoring round um, inclusions in there. Just was there anything that you took decisions to give money back on that you weren't achieving on? And um, then, how were the decisions taken for what you drew down then, then from the monitoring rounds? I'm going to let Peter answer the, the, the detail of that, but you've asked sort of two particularly key questions, and they, get, they will get very technical. Because one of them is about our opening baseline and how we get money in year for various central initiatives and how that then inflates to a much larger budget yeah. by the end of the year. That's, that's the <coughs> first part of this. And the second bit then is the interplay between budgeting figures and estimates. figures that are put in the estimates, which are which are which are, can be quite different and can get quite technical. Yeah. Which is why I'm going to let Peter answer. Okay. So in terms of what we work with on a, an annual basis, uh, you're right. Our budget is our baseline budget on the revenue side is about. 55 million. We then get in-year funds in relation to our executive central funds. So we, they're not included in our in our opening baseline, but we are assured of them coming. The 600 and whatever million that you refer to, I presume, is in relation to the HIA uh, costings that we included within the uh, estimates bill last week. Okay. Uh, that is actually an estimate of the cost over the entire. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, yeah. so you do I'm certainly the, the figures for you for the, the the budget's going to hit suddenly have 666 million odds in it and yes, yeah, so from the baseline of 57 it's just working right. out how one becomes the other super so that 600 odd million is not an annual spend or an annual budget but again what we have to do for the estimates is make an uh, make a an estimate of what is required over the course of that program so for HIA the 600 uh, million in total. Uh, I think the 600 million total included HIA, included victims payments, and it's over the course of what we know. So HIA is over seven years. At this stage, our estimate, the 400 million, 105 million for victims payments, and then there are various other movements. So there's a distinct 
difference between our estimates and our annual budgets. What we do spend each year, 55 million plus about another 20 million of in-year in allocations in terms of our central funds, in terms of Brexit, uh, etc. We get about 45% of that for next year, so that's why it's coming down to around about the 50 million. The 45% is, is a standard amount that all departments are, are allocated, I suppose, in the vote on account. It's not to do with budget setting at all, and it's set at 45%, so it doesn't prejudice any budget setting that still has to happen. So everybody gets it. It's about keeping the lights on. It's about ensuring we can continue to spend until the budget for 2021 <coughs> is actually uh, set. And again, that is still under consideration. It's very much uh, going to be led by the, uh, the budget that's, that's going to be announced in Westminster on the 11th of, of March. And we will take our lead from that. So, again, there's just a, a number of different elements to our budgets, estimates, and accounts. They're all very uh, different and distinct, and, and, and unfortunately, serve different purposes. But, the, but these are supplementary estimates for 19, 19, 20, 19, 2020. So, this is the current year. So, you're bidding for money, hundreds of millions for. No, we're not, we're not bidding. This is the, 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 the budget bill going through at the moment, it's not a bidding exercise. Oh. What it does is um, it, it formalises and give it, gives us legislative authority to spend any in-year allocations that we did get from the point that the main estimates were set last October. We've only received a small amount of in-year allocations. We received about uh, 600,000 or 800,000 in the January monitoring round, and that was to take forward the work in relation to HIA and, uh, and victims' payments. We also, uh, I think, received some of those executive central funds as well. So. Whereas we've got the budget, we need the legal authority to spend that budget, and that's what uh, the budget bill will do next week in the SSEs. But the SSEs uh, serves that one purpose. It also serves that purpose of looking forward, looking what provisions have to be made within our AMI budget, and that's where you know, the, that large 600 million comes from. So again, there, there are different elements to, to the budget bill next week uh, uh, that's going through. I did warn you, you said to me I did warn you, you that you that 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 very that 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 keep going here <laughs> right over the top of my head thank, thank okay. you chair okay. I'm, I'm speaking to your briefing paper that you put in our table papers on yeah. the budgetary pressures <clears throat> so you have a baseline of 55 million uh, but for the next financial year 2021 you appear to suggest that baseline is 5 million short of what you need and beyond that, with executive central funds, historical institutional abuse, victims' pensions, <coughs> and future relations, you're actually 120 million short of what you need. So you actually need about 175 million. Is that correct? Yes, that's what that says. Wow. And the Department of Health say they need 661 million to stand still. Where's the money going to come from? And again, the, the, the large part of that 120 million is, is in relation to the HIA and yeah. victims' payments, as you can see. Uh, and again, we've discussed that already in terms of that is the subject of ongoing negotiations as to who and where that comes from. The yeah, but if I was a victim or I was a victim of institutional abuse and I was watching this, and I'm told <clears throat> we need 175 million but we've only got 55, I would be concerned. Well, I think the point we would make to that, um, Mr. Nesbitt, is that is that um, under the because we took the the HIA forward on a statutory basis and we had the legislation actually in place, which was important to give that confidence to victims, it means that they have a legal entitlement to the funding, and that's important. So where a, a victim can establish uh, that they suffered abuse and they are, a payment is made, they have a legal entitlement to that payment. So the government will have to find it. Okay. The executive will have to find it. In, in paragraph two, we're going to narrative now. You're, you're talking about why the baseline isn't enough. You go back five years and talk about budget cuts, and you also talk about additional work that the uh, department has, has, has absorbed, which is fine. But is it not the case that over the last five years you've also had easements with work that they used to fall to the department, which has been transferred to other departments? There were some functions that transferred uh, a number of years ago, 2016, um, with, the, with, the, with the change in departments, but the budget would have transferred with those. Well, would so it not have been a fuller transfer? disclosure to have said that as well as the additional work that you've undertaken, there were also easements? Well, it's not actually an easement. Um, it's a budget transfer. 
So where a function uh, transfers from one department to another and a responsibility transfers, then the appropriate budget moves with it. So there's no gain to or, 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 or loss to, to, the, to the, the department. The function that we were spending the money on would transfer to another department along with the requisite budget. So it doesn't actually affect. We should, should still have left what budget we need to deliver what we're, 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 we're then responsible for. If we go to paragraph five, and, and I'm not actually, Mark, expecting you to, to comment on this, but delivering social change has pressures and you identify those as being completion of Bright Start and the Social Investment Fund. Yep. And I'm not going to go over old ground about the Social Investment Fund, but I want to put on the record that the Executive agreed SIF on the 22nd of March 2011 as an £80 million programme to be delivered over four years. This document makes clear there will still be financial pressures to deliver SIF in financial year 22-23, which means that the failure to deliver SIF in a timely and effective manner means there are pressures on your budget seven years after that four-year project was supposed to be completed. Not just resource Dell, uh, but I think at paragraph 34, nearly eight million pounds of capital debt. And I just want to put on record the fact that I, I think that is highly, highly regrettable. Can we go, so, can please? Can I, so you wish the opportunity to comment on it? Yeah, I mean, we will say a bit more. We have another, we have another meeting which we'll pick up on, on, on the Social Investment Fund. Um, but I think I, I, would, I would make the point, yes, with 80 million, that was identified at that point in time. I think our spend um, is going to be in about the mid-80s, and there was an agreement that to, to extend the amount up to 93 million by the, the executive. But the learning from that, and it's been learning for everyone, including those who were in the executive who set the target at the time, the learning for that is that when you have a major program, uh, and when it requires community consultation, when it requires projects to be brought forward, to be appraised and analysed, you need to allow sufficient time for that to happen. That's the learning. That's what the audit office uh, put in as a key recommendation. That's the learning we've tried to apply in other other pro pro programmes. And the funding that was made available uh, when it wasn't used was uh, either used for other purposes within TEO or eased back to the Department of Finance. So it wasn't funding that uh, was lost. Let me take you to paragraph 35, which is our costs associated with New Decade, uh, New Approach. The Office of Identity and Cultural Expression with the two commissioners over the next three financial years. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me that doesn't say that that will cost 28 and one quarter million pounds. Sorry, which paragraph is that, Mike? Not... 35. Sorry, 35. Sorry, 35. Yeah. Are we talking over the, over, the, over the three years? Yes. Um, that is what it says, um, but I did, I did, I did say when, I, when we were commenting on this that, um, as yet, we're not, we don't have a very clear picture of um, precisely how those offices are going to operate. But the um, figures are very precise, Mark. Well, five million eight hundred and thirty-three thousand pounds next year. Eleven million mm -hmm. five hundred and eighteen the following year. Ten million nine hundred twenty-two thousand. I helped set up with colleagues the Victims Commission from, from memory. We were doing it on a million a year. The budget today is for less than one and a half million for the Victims Commission. Well, it depends where you count the spend and so forth here. Yeah. Um, but but I mean, 28 million over the next three years? Why is that needed and what will it be spent on? Well, um, what this is is our estimate of the cost. Ministers will have to decide whether but based that on is, what? whether that, well, I'm just going to explain that. Ministers will have to decide whether that, what, what exactly is the function they want for those offices, how quickly they want them to be able to implement those functions and what the extent of those functions are. They will also have to take decisions around things like uh, there's, there's grant giving powers uh, available to the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, for example, what size of a budget would be available there. Those decisions haven't been taken. So these are not firm figures. Now, yeah, that's why they are precise, and I understand why you would say that. Maybe we should have rounded them off a, bit, a little bit. Uh, given the fact that we um, don't really know exactly what kind uh, of uh, the, 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 the precise range, extent, and um, speed with which um, these uh, functions have to be delivered, we have looked to say, are there any other similar bodies currently out there that look as if they have broadly similar functions? And we've taken the budget from there and said, that's the best estimate we can come up with at, at, Which at, bodies at, were they? at the moment. So in terms of the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, um, 
one of the key responsibilities it has, according to the legislation, it puts responsibilities on public authorities to, um, to do certain, certain things. It looks quite similar to the Equality Commission. So we took the figure for the Equality Commission and said, that's the best comparator we have. But look, it might be different. And these are only marker bids. These are not precise costs. In terms of, the, of, of what might the Irish Language Commissioner look like and the Ulster Scots, Ulster British Commissioner look like, we don't know. It could be somewhere between the, um, the, the Children's Commissioner or the Older Persons Commissioner, and we put a cost in around that. These are only very broad estimates. They could be half this, they could be more than this. It will depend on what ministers and the executive and indeed the Assembly actually want these bodies to do. So they're, they're only cider bids, Mike. These are not precisely worked out and detailed estimates. You see, with, with some of the others, such as institutional abuse, you put in a narrative. You say there are variables, and, and we've discussed the fact I don't think mm. you put in mm. enough variables. There's no commentary. Well, well, happy to add Would that. it not have been better to replace five million eight hundred and thirty-three thousand pounds with "don't know"? Well, it, 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 I don't think it would, because while we don't know the precise amount, it's important that some provision is made, because we know it's the will of the Assembly, and the, sorry, we know it's, if it's in the in the NDNA agreement that these offices will be established. We know it says that the legislation should be brought in within three months. So there's an imperative to have some funding there for these offices to be put in place. So it would be remiss of us to put nothing in. Uh, all we can do is make our best guess. Uh, can I say just it. very, very briefly on that, Mr Chairman? Uh, in terms of saying that it looks like the Equality Commission, the Equality Commission is made up of more than one individual, so there's already where I don't think this will look like that. And secondly, the Equality Commission has a, a wide um, remit. remit in terms of private business. There's been no suggestion in anything about NDNA that this office will have an, an impact upon private businesses and stuff like that. So I think the figure might be a bit inflated. Oh, I'm happy. I'm sorry to cut across to no, you're okay, but you for your if, indulgence. If, if you look at the, the Compact Civic Advisory Panel, in financial year 21-22, the Office of Identity with the two commissioners is going to cost 41 times the cost of a Compact Civic Advisory Panel. It just, it just seems like nonsense to me. And I'm sorry, Mark, but I think, I think one of the lessons from, from the RHI debacle was that another statutory committee, rightly or wrongly, was heavily criticised for not spotting things. So I, I think, as a committee, we all need, particularly with finances, to, to, to up our game. And but I, I you're, would you're saying we, we are costing things that we, we, we don't even know the functions that are agreed for these things. That's right. But I mean, this if is it was the a private sector. It just would, the paper would be shredded. It'd be told, forget it. And if it was a private sector, I suspect there wouldn't be any commitment to do something there where the cost wasn't known. But we're not in the private sector; we're in the public sector. And the real politic of all of this is there. There's been an agreement that has been signed up to by all the parties, which has in it a range of commitments. Uh, which require funding and resource, and that as civil servants we have to try and identify what that resource might be uh, and ensure that there's some provision made and is taken in, into account by those who are deciding on the finances. What we have put in is some estimates of what we think uh, the figures might be. They will not be right. Okay. I know that I accept okay. they won't I, be right. I, 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 and they're not meant to be precise costings, okay. they're just marker bids. Okay, so that's your best guess, and you've done it by thinking about this could be a bit like the Equality Commission, what does that cost? Back of the, I mean, the, the fact you've gone down to you know the, the, the fourth figure, you know five million, yes, but five million eight hundred thirty-three thousand sounds like a very exact calculation. Well, I explained why yes. that was the case. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I, I think people will be very surprised that it's going to cost twenty-eight and a quarter million potentially to run this over the next three years. But it might not, and that would be dependent on the decisions that ministers make, the decisions executive make, and 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 the passage through the assembly of all of all these bills. Thank you, Okay, um, Pat. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a short question. Uh, Mark, uh, how, how have you prioritised the department's spend needs for 2020 2021? Well, the, 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 the sort of broad approach that has been um, agreed by uh, ministers is, is the one that's been in place for, for a, a number of years, which is that we look at any. Um, statutory obligations that, that the department has or sort of thing bodies have to, to deliver and try and make sure that they are safeguarded. Um, we look at any contractual commitments uh, that the department's entered into in terms of the delivery of programmes. Uh, and after that, we then look at um, 
where there's a, a, a programme for government commitment and try and protect that as far as possible. Uh, and we look at then uh, whether our ministerial priorities and try to uh, make sure that they are brought through as far as possible. Beyond that, there's also been a, a standing um, um, policy of supporting the victims' budget. Um, and that has, that has been maintained at uh, uh, flat cash for, that, for the last number uh, of years. So that's the broad policy that, that we have taken in looking at, if we do that, where do the pressures uh, come in? We've also looked then at, are there any of these um, programmes where there might be value in expanding some of the provision? That's why I mentioned the poss possibility of doing some more around urban villages, if ministers agree, and they decide it's important and the money's there, and there's, there's the possibility of looking at another delivering social change type approach if, if ministers feel that there's value in having some sort of central pot that can encourage the development of new approaches which can then be mainstreamed into departments to help with transformation, whether it be in health, education or early intervention, wherever that may be. And uh, when, when you say that there's uh, an precedent in terms of supporting the victim's budget, does that include the, the new victim's payment scheme? Uh, is that going to be incorporated into that? Uh, view? Um, well, no, what I was referring to was the funding for the Victim and Survivor Service. Right, okay. Uh, uh, that's, that, right. that's the extent of that commitment. I think the funding for the Victim's Payments is going to be a subject of, of negotiation with the, uh, with, the, with the British Government. Right, and, and just in terms of, there's, there's no business case yet for the, the Victim Scheme, is there? No. Uh, <coughs> and we had a, a short discussion last week around the, the cost and who's going to carry that cost mm -hmm. uh, and if, if you look at the projected costs for the HIA which could be upwards of 600 million uh, and we discussed last week the the PSNI hearing loss claims which is running at 160 180 million you would tend to think I mean uh, intuitively you would think that this would be a bigger claim than either of those. Would you agree with that? Um, I prefer not to use intuition alone. What we're trying to, to do is look at what is the, the scope of the regulations, who, what categories of people uh, or, or victims are in and, and, and which are out, and then what um, figures do we have about the numbers that are there and what assumptions can we make about those coming forward. I agree it will be much bigger. It would be a much bigger figure than the 100 million I referred to for over a couple of years, but I honestly could not at this point um, give you a sense of what that figure is likely to be. That, that does require much more detailed working out. Um, we're starting to work on a business case. It wasn't something we expected to have to do, because normally that's done by whoever in initiates the policy. So we've been sort of, something has come to us that we now have to try and cost. And I don't want to give you a figure because it could be very wrong. I understand that. I mean, and I don't want you to be plucking figures out of the air, but mm. if you use the PSNI hearing loss claims and the HIA mm. uh, as comparators, I mean, this is bigger than both of those probably put together, I would say. Well, I, I, I'm not sure. I would have to go and I'm not sure they're, they're exactly analogous. I mean, they're, they're similar big, big. Uh, um, spending pro programmes, but I think they're not the same. I think we need to look at the specifics and I'd rather not sort of say that they're, they're the same. We need to look at this and break it down into, into the factors that will drive the costs and then what's our best sense of, of the extent of those factors and then come, come, come to a cost. So I, I'd rather not be drawing any sort of uh, a figure on that. Okay, and just Although one final speak. one, Chair. Uh, any idea, timeline for the business case being finished? Uh, no, we're only in the early stages of the business case. As you can appreciate, the regulations were finalised at the end of January. Um, we've been working on the practical uh, aspects of trying to, to put some of the names in place. Uh, but part of that requires a full understanding of what the regulations actually mean, which is where we are at the moment. Uh, and alongside that, we're starting to develop and get a better understanding of what, of what the bits of a business case would be. In order to do the business case, we need to know things I just mentioned about who exactly can qualify here and how many might be in that category and then what sort of an award there might be. So that, that requires some probing around the regulations and some consideration of, of um, what the implications are of those regulations. But we haven't been involved in a detailed policy development. It's quite difficult and takes time to pick up 
all that background knowledge and understanding to be able to actually develop the business case. So I couldn't give you a time on that, but it's something that we've started work on. Ballpark figure? You're not going to get me to give a ballpark figure. Okay. Please. Thanks, Joe. Uh, George? <coughs> um, Chair, how is the department managing the deficit of 2.5? And uh, what lines of spend are going to be impacted? Just a short question. Which two point five million de deficit is it we're talking about, George? Is there one part of the paper that you're you're looking at? Core department department. Mm -hmm. Core department managing the de deficit. Sorry, which which paragraph is that in the paper? Is that last week's paper? I think it was in oh, the, was the uh, looking at the deficit of the department that it was running, and I think that was over a number of years. Isn't that right, George? Yeah. <coughs> 0.6%. I don't have last week. Yeah. 7.6%. Yeah. So that, that, that uh, comes from a position whenever we have got our budget last year, so this was at the opening <coughs> in 1920. We received our budget, which was reduced by 3.6%. We then allocated that across that production across our arms link bodies in the department in line with the priorities that Mark outlined earlier. We then know that even with the budget cut, we still have to absorb inescapable costs like paying price inflation. And that's the figure that comes out at the end. That's why it, it's a lot. We've looked at a number, a range of ways of, of addressing that in year. Uh, we have, I suppose, looking to the longer term, we've 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 reduced uh, program budget allocations in the initial term. We've looked at our vacancies. We've looked at uh, any other ways we can reduce costs. But back to another point, Mark said as well earlier. Last year or the current year, we were fortunate enough to be able to redeploy the financial easements that uh, we benefited from because we didn't have to pay for ministers and spads and the support functions around uh, in the absence of an executive. So the three -year that's, that's a non-recurring yeah. issue. We, we will not have that, obviously, luxury this year from a financial perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well recovered. <laughs> well recovered. <laughs> well recovered. I'm sorry, maybe not. <laughs> maybe you were right. Um, okay, then, Christopher. Um, in terms of, you, you mentioned there that um, deficits were allocated across the arm's length bodies, <coughs> and the figures we have are that the arm's length bodies are managing a 3% deficit. Um, what lines of spend are being impacted there? In terms across of your arm's length bodies? Okay, so they would be allocated a budget, and then it's for each individual arm's length body to look within their respective areas to determine how best to, to meet the budget they've been allocated. So, uh, again, a lot of work that's happened over the past number of years because we have been cut. We've been one of the two or three departments that has been mm -hmm. suffered budget reductions. They've done a lot of work around uh, accommodation primarily, so a lot mm -hmm. of them have co-located um, in, in one location. We've moved people out of expensive leases uh, and moved them into uh, cheaper maybe uh, leases or even into public buildings, DOF-owned buildings. So there's been a range of initiatives in that sort of area to help manage it in the past. Uh, again, uh, organisations have also looked at, uh, again, vacancy control, vacancy management uh, to help control that. But again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's down to in each individual organisation. In terms of the um, New Deal, new, or New Decade, New Approach document, and this is a, a hobby horse of mine, I've been on this theme for years, um, a review of arm's length bodies has been included in the words in um, New Deal twice. New decade, yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm just going to adopt Michelle O'Neill. It's NDNA. That'll do. Um, the um, well NDNA document um, uh, contains within it a review of arms length bodies, and the wording is very specific, with a view to rationalisation. Just wondering, has the department started scoping exercise or anything? <coughs> we we haven't started a, a, a specific scoping. I imagine that that will be something that will be done. Um, are taken forward on a, on a cross-departmental basis. Yeah. It was done before by the previous uh, executive. Uh, it was kept under under review. 
um, we have some experience of closing an NDPB because we closed uh, ILEX mm. um, some was it three or four years ago. We're still closing it. Um, and I say that because um, while we transferred the functions in a very uh, quick, almost immediately, and the department took on the functions and there were appropriate financial savings from that, the actual process of winding up the organisation, dealing with liabilities and so forth that, that mm. uh, we're still on the, on the books has taken the last three, three to four years. So this is not an easy or a, a quick um, um, approach, but I think, I think we may be the last department to have closed an arm's length body. I'm not 100% sure about that claim, but certainly in that case it was beneficial to us. I think we have managed to progress the um, development of that site in a much speedier basis, and there have been, there have been financial savings arising from that. But um, rationalising arm's length bodies is, is a very complex um, task. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I remember during the talks asking for a full list of the outside bodies, either that are ALBs or that have a sponsor department, and it runs to several hundred. But I mean, ultimately, that's that's money, and um, and I think from memory, I think there's a historic buildings trust and a historic monuments trust. Why why are those two separate organisations? Well, that's absurd, you know. But no, that's that's grand. Thank you. Kind on hobby horse again. Mm -hmm. uh, Send you to the poisons <coughs> council. That's another one that I remember from. Don't worry, he's got that hobby horse from a city council. A smaller <laughs> government. Uh, no, yeah, no. <laughs> but uh, in paragraph two Sorry, of the briefing me. paper, um, and that it uh, outlines that there's been a 25 percent cut in real terms over the past five years, which must have had a, 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 a department a huge impact on the ability to. Uh, the plan and the 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 the, the future, uh, but uh, the, it mentions that they're requiring additional funding through the budget of 2023. Uh, the process to, to address the deficit and baseline funding. What happens if you don't get the money? Um, well, if we don't get the funding, then that will impact, we'll have to pass, well first of all we'll have to discuss with ministers just how we actually apply the necessary reduction to remain within budget. I'll go back to what I just talked about earlier on in terms of the priorities around uh, um, statutory responsibilities and so forth. It means we'll have to pass on these these reductions to our bodies as well as uh, taking uh, an impact in the department, but there'll simply be things that won't be able to be done um, and there will be things that will be late and we think it will be uh, much slower because we simply won't have the resource to be able to do it. And the NDNA, as I've just, we just talked about, has put on this department some significant extra responsibilities. Uh, plus we have the victims' payments, which came from Westminster onto this department. And we have the HIA now moving into major delivery uh, modes. There are very significant pressures. So uh, if we don't have the baseline resource, we simply won't be able to do all of those things and everything else we're currently doing. Uh, and, and it will impact on our arms length bodies as well. So it, it would be very significant if if, if we didn't um, get at least some of that pressure met. Okay. Okay. Just, just ask yes. one sure. It goes back to uh, what was said about the, the, the outside bodies. And, um, and it, it, over to when I thought it was, to, uh, I thought no, the, the last time I've seen someone was about 120 or 130. Uh, and then have we ever uh, seen a figure of how much it actually costs? Uh, the the room uh, that 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 amount of bodies and has there been any discussion within the department uh, that what it would be like if, if they were brought a lot of them were brought on house. Um, I I haven't seen a, a figure that that I could give you that would would, would say something about about um, <coughs> what the cost is they are with bodies um, and I I don't know if one exists. Um, but I think it is important to make, to make this point that, that it's not all saving because there's a lot of functions that are delivered by arm length bodies. Some are very specialist, and that's why they are in place. There's something like uh, somewhere, I think it may be in the region of 70-80% of government funding would go out through arm length bodies. So if all of those functions came back into departments, there'd be very significant additional pressures on departments. So it wouldn't be, I think it, it wouldn't be right to look at this as a way of, of uh, that every pound there that's currently spent would be saved. There may be savings if things are done in a different way, but you, you couldn't assume that, that the entire amount that's spent there would all be saved. You know that out there, you know, and it's been for quite a while, even when I, back when I was on the council, 
that for many that it was seen as a nice wee earner for uh, for people who were coming to retirement or retirement and and walking in the the, 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 the these bodies that the pay yearly fund of uh, the money. But in fairness, are things like our trusts, health trusts, are arm's length bodies? Are there our education authority is an arm's length yeah. body? So yeah. Yeah, there's some of them that you have to have there. But if they, there, there are also the public has the impression that like is the poisons council and things like that. But yeah, it's not to pick on it. But Emma, thanks, chair. Um, just in relation to the um, fund that you mentioned for 2019-20 for uh, cross departmental program delivery. <coughs> 19.3 million uh, for, for 1920. Is there a, a figure there for 2021? So the, the equivalent figure for that is in the briefing paper today in paragraph 5, and that's the 16.5 million. Um, the reason that has changed is uh, the 19.3, which is this year's figure, uh, reflects a bigger. Uh, expenditure within the DSC line because this year there's a, a lot more activity within the social investment fund delivering out I think there's about 20 or 25 projects being delivered out at the moment uh, so that's reducing uh, in that regard uh, for this year but that's that's the equivalent amount yeah okay right thank you and Trevor um, in relation to maybe I just want to maybe supplement uh, what Fra and maybe on Christopher's area. I'm intrigued at your response, Mark, in terms of the spend. At what stage will there be a piece of work actually done to see if there's value for money? And I mean, obviously, the other name is Quango, so I, th I think we'll accept that there's the health and there's the education and all, the, all of those others. But it's the Quangos, I think, that was, was the ones that we're really concerned about. Because whilst you did say in response about 75% of that money, well, the department is, would have to bring that back with it. But what value for money has ever been weighted to or not or otherwise against the Quangos? Well, every arm and length body um, is, is subject to review normally around every five years. Um, and um, as part of that, they look at um, uh, there's a review of whether the ongoing function or, or requirement remains for the arm and length body and then whether it should continue in the form in which it's in. So there's, there's that review built in. And obviously, there's, <coughs> then, there's then the audit office. Uh, would occasionally look at um, our health bodies um, and would um, make some assessment around uh, the extent to which they function effectively or, or, or value from money. So those would be the two that would spring to mind for me. Yeah, and I, and I seem to recall as well, under a previous executive, uh, the Department of Finance, um, under the Budget Review Group or some form of uh, ministerial yeah. subgroup. Yeah undertook a review or started a review of arms length bodies looking at, at this sort of issue. Now, I'm not sure where that went to, but it certainly was something under that budget review group heading that, that, that was looked at. I mean, I previously sat in the audit office, or sorry, the, the plan, uh, audit, not the audit committee, the uh, PAC, uh, and I value the work the audit office is doing. However, I think given the number of clangos we have, I think it would probably be full-time working at those if they were going to scrutinise those all. So. I'm not sure that that would have been the best uh, method. But in terms of, you, you talked about maybe looking at their delivery and their functions. Well, I see what about value for money. Because it's interesting even in response to that Peter had, had given to someone early about you've been looking at leases now and you're reviewing these leases of, I think the word you used was expensive leases. Mm -hmm. Why does it take to a stage where we're getting cash strapped that we look at expensive leases when we're not looking at that on an ongoing basis? Well, I think to be fair on that one, uh, we were ahead ahead of the, the game on that one because there's been work done on that over the last five or six years uh, in TEO and there's a number of our arms like bodies are actually in the same <coughs> building, down the Quality House for example, where they they share the building and they have shared services. So we were somewhat ahead of the game in terms of making a number of those those savings, um, but it's something that's the responsibility of every arms like body, in fact every every department as well to look at the cost effective delivery uh, of services and to reduce costs like that. There's also been a significant uh, central initiative by the Department of Finance in mm -hmm. terms of um, prop property management and making sure that all leases are, um, there's a discussion with them before any further leases are entered into to try and make sure that look right across the government estate to see if there are 
uh, alternative ways of providing the accommodation in a, in a cheaper way. So that's been ongoing. It's, it's a central initiative. And also it's just as, as and when leases either expire or you come yeah. to a break clause, okay. you have the opportunity to review it. And, and that's really bringing a focus on, on that to, you know, pinch point or that timing. Yeah. Yeah, to okay. make sure that but I, I, I suppose the cynic in me would say, why were we ever in those expensive leases in the first place? Why are we in the mm. centre of Belfast, which is probably the most expensive place to rent property? And why did the government own some of these buildings themselves as opposed to actually taking them off the private sector? But that's just a... He had his hobby horse, that would be a hobby horse of mine. Um, in relation to the requirements for the 2021 to allow the department to take forward the commitments of the NDNA, um, what, sorry, what are the requirements of that, given... Has there been an audit of... Sorry, what was that? Has there been an audit of... What? what it's going to cost? Yeah, what exactly falls on it? Well, the, the, main, the main thing is that, that, that arrived around DNA were the things that I, I, I talked about, the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, the Irish Language Commissioner, also Scott Seltzer, the British Commissioner, the Commission for Ministry of Standards, the Compact Civic Advisory Panel, and the Bill of Rights Experts. They're the ones that fall to the, the Executive Office uh, to have some role in. And when we had a bit of a discussion there about, about the estimates that are here and the extent to which they may, may be subject to further refinement. Um, in terms of the wider agreement, there's, there is work ongoing just to, to map out what all of those commitments are um, and then to look at uh, uh, just, just how best they might be uh, brought forward in a way that's manageable. But, but then, and something else that was said, I mean, it's not, you used the words, of course, but it's in the document in relation to <coughs> the language piece with the three month time frame. So we're probably, what, we're four or five weeks in that first three months. Um, not that I'm asking you to rush this, but um, <laughs> surely by this stage there should be some, some initial costings of what this is going to look like and how much this is going to cost. Well, um, there are some of the timescales that are in the NDNA are extremely challenging. Um, I mean, at the minute there's, there's some draft legislation which is attached to um, the overall agreement and was published, um, but um, we have to just work through just... just what is in the legislation? What is the intent, the policy intent? Because again, this was this was not something that we were uh, involved in. This part came out of the political talk, so we need to understand what the thinking was behind that, what the the full extent of the responsibilities are, what what the expectations are around this, in order to be able to first of all get the legislation uh, right and get it in, in, introduced and associate with that, be able to give you some estimate, of course. What we have in here is only a marker bid to make yeah, sure that there's sure. Some, some provision there. I mean, these figures <coughs> will not be right. Now, I wasn't intending to convey any spurious accuracy with them. Uh, they're, they're just to make sure there's some provision there. Not, nor was I inferring that, of course. Yeah. Um, and you talk about political. It was a very big political because it was two governments. It was, wasn't the government here that agreed. That, that's their document. Um, but given that we are on a tight time frame and, and people have commitments within relation to that, um, can you give us assurance, and I'll maybe strain off slightly, Chairman, if you give me indulgence, but assurance that we will get a proper opportunity to scrutinise um, that piece of legislation and that it won't be coming in some form of accelerated passage mm -hmm. to the Assembly? Because given it is, there is a controversial nature to that, but yes, it is in the document, and I recognise that, but we're five weeks in, we've still no costings, and I would want an assurance that we're actually going to get an opportunity to scrutinise that before it comes to the House. Well, I think the, the handling of, of the legislation, as with everything else, would be a matter that ministers will need to decide on, and we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing that with ministers. So it's not one for me to decide, it's one for ministers to, to decide. Well, do you know what we expect then? Do we relay that? Certainly, I'll, I'll re relay that, yeah. Okay. okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. I want to conclude with um, two comments um, rather than questions. Um, there, there has been a certain rule of scenarios. We're, we're just back. There's been a document that hasn't had an opportunity to be costed. There are a lot of circumstances that are impacting your budget. But based on that, you know, today I had a 10 o'clock, a 10.30, a 12 o'clock and a 1 o'clock appointment before coming down here at 1.40 for the meeting. Receiving a document at 10.30 is not going to cut it because I didn't have time to look at what is a substantial document. Um, is it 12 13, 14 pages, you just don't have time to digest it. So, and I appreciate that I'm not apportioning blame to your two selves here for that. As I say, there could be a certain amount of circumstance, but going forward, we just simply cannot have that. Cannot have delivery 
two, three hours before meeting because our diaries are filled and it just means that there's things in there that I'm going to end up looking at you. I don't understand it and I don't understand the reply back and I will have to follow it up. Um, and with all those things that impact you in your department, which again are not your issues or fault, um, I don't like your budget because it's filled with so many variables that run from 100 million at one end to 600 million at another end to things that you might have to do to things that you might have to do to things that you may cut or you may not cut or you may not be able to cut and um, i think we all as a, a political grouping right around this building have went through what rhi was and we saw the forensic detail that accountability that we could be held to at the other end of processes and I would be entirely expecting that the committee will be asking you to come back up on a regular basis <coughs> to provide us with information as you get it, that there is much more clarity around those figures and that there's not big wide goalposts um, and big uh, numbers that we're, we're not going to be expecting. And I think we'll journey through that process together and it'll start with us giving you the due notice us getting the papers in time <coughs> and then us being able to clarify matters with you in here at those meetings. But we must go through that process because the public expect it of us. And at the minute, I don't have every confidence that there's a full understanding of what your budget's going to be going forward. So we'll have to go through that process together. But thank you very much for coming up and presenting it to us. And Peter, I'll come back to you on those figures because I'll get some understanding. I just make one comment, Chair, uh, yep. which is that I appreciate that there's something to desire for papers very quickly. The one week from last week to this week to get uh, papers written and get them cleared and out puts us under some difficulty. So if there's any any opportunity for scheduling to allow more time, it'll mean the committee will have more will have more time to prepare and the committee will have more time to actually consider those. So I appreciate some things are urgent and some yep. the committee wants something very urgently, but where there's a the potential to schedule in that way, I think it would be helpful for all of us to get the papers in time. Of course. But I think you would have had budget time skills anyway, so it must have been the clearance that was causing the delay because you would be constantly preparing for, for budgets and spring estimates and, and budget time, so you would have been in the process anyway, so it must have been in that clearance for them, but thank you very much indeed, and we'll keep in contact. Okay, thank you. Well, we take a raise for 30 seconds and then we can get into the next bit. There's only a wee bit left, there's not much left. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're happy enough, I think, with the actions from that, unless um, there's other items. Um, we have then next item uh, seven, of, which is the forward work programme. It's on page 32. Um, are you members happy to, to note that? It's pretty much yeah. just an update of what we had from last week. Item 8 then, uh, we have correspondence. Uh, there's one item on page 37. Um, it's a correspondence from the Chair of the Committee of Procedures, which is copied to us, uh, which is going to the First and Deputy First Minister, asking to be informed of any plans that the Executive has to bring forward legislation that may necessitate changes to standing orders. So in, just in accordance with the protocols, um, it's been sent to this committee, but are we content to note? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so noted. Um, item 9, Chairperson's Business. I refer you to page 40 of the pack, which is an invite from the House of Lords European Union Committee to a working lunch in Parliament buildings on 20th of February, which is next Tuesday. Um, I will be attending that, but there is also capacity for two or three other members. Could I ask if anybody wishes to attend that, if they could contact Marie by the close of play of Friday, please, and then we can make sure that people are updated for attendances. Um, the House of Lords Committee is also seeking views on the European Commission's 3rd of February recommendation for a Council decision authorising the opening of negotiations for a new partnership with the UK and Northern Ireland, together with the UK Government's written ministerial statement on UK-EU relations. Um, I'm going to suggest to members that we respond to uh, Lord Kinnell advising <coughs> that the committee hasn't yet had an opportunity to explore the impact of that, but we will, and that maybe just effectively send a holding letter to say uh, we haven't had a chance to look at it, but when we do, we will come back to you with 
uh, our, our view on that. They also participate in that inter-parliamentary forum that we mentioned last week, and they will meet informally if people join them next uh, Tuesday. But the actual formal written submission, just to say we haven't had a chance to explore it yet, and when we do, we will forward our information. Are, are members happy? Okay. Uh, are there any other business items that members would like to bring? Okay, uh, I confirm you then that our next meeting is next Wednesday at 2 o'clock and that is the meeting to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.